Okay. All right, it's 7 o'clock. We'll call this meeting to order. Bailey, can we get a roll call, please? Councilmember Backus? Here. Councilmember Bain? Here. Councilmember Husnick? Here. Councilmember Eigner? Here. And Mayor Winnick? Here. I'd like to ask everybody to rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I will look for an approval of the agenda. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to our open forum. Thank you, Bailey. Marge, welcome. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I come to you here with several issues today. What's my time limit? <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes is what we ask. I'll try to be fast. If you folks have been watching the uh, front pages of the St. Paul Pioneer Press and the Minneapolis paper, you will uh, understand that we're having a crisis in our recycling. China has refused to take our recycling anymore and that leaves, um, leaves us hanging. 91% of the plastic, for instance, that we are collecting is going right now to the Hennepin County burner. So we're collecting it and giving it to Hennepin County so that they can resell it to their customers who are buying the heat from them. Uh, if I'd like to, I would like to give you an example of plastic and why it is not recyclable, it's not practical. If you had a hamburger and you seasoned it with salt and pepper and Tabasco sauce and garlic salt and Worcestershire, whatever else you put, put it in, put in it, and cooked it on the grill to a well-done status. You can never take that hamburger apart again and make it rare or medium rare. And that's what's happening to our plastic. It's all made with different ingredients and different temperatures and different characters in it so that it has no second use except to be burned or landfilled. Number one and number two narrow neck plastic can be reused and I would like for you to consider making that part of our contract again. Some of the things that we're getting in plastic that people wish could be recycled would be plastic toys, snow shovels, sleds, your garden hose, kids' pools, one-time use food containers, bike rims, appliances, tires, construction debris, plastic bags, film, propane, and helium cylinders. All of that is contamination to what our goals are. Um, next issue. On December 4th of last year, I came before you and requested an increase in our fees due to a 10% increase in our tipping fees at Newport, and nothing happened. As a result, we've had a $5,000 a month increase since January 1st. I would like to ask you right now for a one-time $1 a month to be added to our um, residential bills to carry us from January 1st until August 1st, and then a $1 increase going forward per month in order to cover just the increase in our tipping fees at Newport. I have suffered increases or experienced increases, not only because of the tipping fees, but my employees deserve a living wage my insurance costs have gone up, my real estate taxes, the cost of buying a new truck, our fuel costs, costs, our tipping fees, and the benefit packages that I offer to my employees. I would like to request um, elimination of our $375,000 performance bond with the city. You will never collect on it. Worst case scenario, our building would burn down, and that happened in 2002. 
We lost nine trucks on a front end loader in that fire and the Forest Lake residents, none of our residents, missed a day of garbage pickup. We've been serving this community for over 54 years, flawlessly, faithfully building our business. And you will not collect on that $375,000 bond because of us. Um, let's see what else I have here. Hey, Marge. Yes, questions. Um, well, I'm just going to interrupt you right there. Um, since this isn't on the agenda tonight, I don't think we can really take any action on it. Um, but I'd be more than willing to add it to next week's agenda. And we can have a full discussion and make whatever determinations we are. That will also allow you to be fully participating in the discussion rather than just the three minutes in the open. I'm giving room. you a warning. My billing should go out August 1st. Okay. And I'll put that out August 1st with the agreement that we will make some adjustments for the September 1st. Possibly. Oh, well, it takes five of us to vote that way. Um, I understand the need. Yeah, but um, you know we have to vote on. Understand. Change. I understand. I would like to have a conversation with you for you to understand what I'm going through mm -hmm. um, on a less public basis, maybe in a workshop that was suggested before and it never got happening. Sure. Never happened. Sure. So, but um, I am making you aware that there is a crisis in recycling, that we are due an increase because of our tipping fees. The increases that we've had since the beginning of the contract have been negligent, neg negligible. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, if we could, maybe you, me, and Dan can sit down this week, uh, put something together, and then bring that forward to next week's council meeting for everybody to review. That's fine. All right, we'll get that set up for Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron. Evening, Ron Schaefer. Uh, my concern again is the stormwater runoff, whatever that you want to call it. It's a, it's a uh, boondoggle. It's worthless. You're charging us for, as people who are guilty of nothing, for something that some of you people, maybe, maybe all of you, are guilty of uh, putting on us people. I don't know who causes the problem of the stormwater runoff. I don't live on a lake, don't swim in one, don't boat, don't fish, and I don't want to pay. So who is the guilty party on these uh, stormwater runoff things? Is somebody uh, did something wrong? Let's get them to pony up the price of repairing the problem, not the rest of us. The other thing is, is this, uh, I see you're going to paint the, uh, the uh, light posts. I can't see a light post. I can't see a light. I don't care about the light posts. Uh, let the city slickers that live in the city that maybe get some benefit from these light posts. I don't know. But let, let's put the blame where it belongs. If that light posts need painting, why don't you give some of the people a brush? Let them paint them. Who cares what color? I don't see them from where I live. And, and it just seems to me that we're making all of us people that live in the township, former township, guilty of, of things that we have nothing to do with. I, I don't think it's uh, fair in any means what you're doing to us. So let's, uh, let, in, in this stormwater runoff, would you please publish what you're doing with that money? I'd like to know. And I know it's not going to benefit me, but if you want to look for a project, I live on a big swamp and the cattails are taken over. How about coming out there and kill them? <laughs> they don't do any good to me and I can't see the water anymore. Come on out there and do me some good. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I do believe the city does have um, a storm or didn't we do a breakdown of what some of those uh, expenditures were for water runoff? Yeah, we, we do have on our website, we have a full page devoted to how that money was spent and what it was used for. We'll get a printout and give it to you next yeah. week. So, I appreciate, we'll that. 
Yeah, we do have that information. Well, unfortunately, a lot of it is not from the city, oh, but yeah. it's unfunded mandates from um, the state, from the watershed districts, other things, but we have to take care of them. And um, so, Does every yeah. Does have, have a strong run on every city? <coughs> every, city ha every city has the expenses. Some of it do it through their tax, and some do it through a separate fee. So, you know, one way or the other, it's still a tax, and it still costs everybody money. And How unfortunately, six dollars to forty. What it is today? <laughs> um, interesting accounting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jim Redfield. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, staff members. Um, I, ha I live here in uh, Forest Lake at 6684 Lipizzan Trail. I have a question and some comments on item number seven on the agenda tonight. Uh, this is a presentation tonight on the pr uh, purchase agreement documents between the former township and the airport uh, uh, property, I believe. Um, I was looking through the agenda packet. I was looking for copies of those documents to review. I couldn't seem to find them. Maybe I missed them. But uh, they're any, being presented to us tonight. We don't have them yet. You don't have them yet, so we'll be able to get at some point in time. The public will be able to review them. For sure. Okay. Will be posted or something. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they'll be on our website. Okay, that's kind of what I was asking for because I wanted to kind of review those. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. All right. Susan Young. Susan Young, 9950, 199th Street North. Um, I was a member of the Comp Plan Task Force, and you're reviewing that this evening. Um, and there were several things that were discussed by the Comp Plan Task Force and, and um, through a lot of public comment. What folks showed up, as, as, as often stated, it's very difficult to get folks to, to come to something that is not an immediate threat, um, especially the, um, the, the planned bike trails uh, along the North Shore area um, that was heavily requested by those residents and, and some of that was, was put together. Um, that is in the comp plan. Um, several of the land use opportunities um, for the future were in there. One thing that was not something that the Comp Plan Task Force discussed is a very large area, almost two square miles in the southwest part of the city, which is labeled highway business. And I was pretty surprised to see that, and so I tried to do my research. And highway business is, serves community and regional needs. It has close proximity to thoroughfares and access to regional highways. It is highly visible from those highways. Um, dealerships, truck stops, hotels are examples of uses there. Um, and I don't understand what the policy reasons were for making this very large area uh, highway commercial. It is not adjacent or visible from large regional highways. Um, I thought perhaps maybe Hugo had, had something that was complimentary that the city was trying to, to go along with. And I looked at the Hugo 2040 draft comp plan, and that's not the case. Immediately adjacent to that, they have um, a development restriction of one dwelling unit per 10 acres. Uh, it's a very long-term, low-density, forever and ever, not forever and ever, but very, very long-term, not. And so um, I'm hoping that during your discussion tonight of the comp plan that I will hear what the policy decision was um, regarding that particular area. Um, I think that perhaps that there are, are better uses. Maybe a presentation at the um, Chamber of Commerce had resulted in that, um, or something at the, at the Rotary had resulted in that. Um, but I would like to, to understand the policy reason behind that. The comp plan and your budget are the two most important policy documents that you all deal with. Um, and this one in particular uh, will set the stage for the city for a very long time. Thank you. All right. 
And that closes out our open forum. Bringing us to consent agenda. Look for a motion there or changes to the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second it. This uh, final copy is that on the agenda? I haven't had time to look at that yet for uh, the Buddhist temple. Yes, it's uh, done. Oh, yeah, there it is, number D. And, yep, or letter D. D. Yep. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Takes us to the regular agenda. Mr. Cheetah, welcome. Mr. Mayor and Council, the reason I'm here with the information that I'm presenting is that um, at a previous meeting, um, you may recall um, some statements were made about the uh, acquisition of the airport property, um, and timing, and principles involved, et cetera. The gentleman asked tonight about that. The reason you don't have the information that I have. And the request was made by your previous administrator that I share the minutes and, and documents that I have with you so that you have some foundational rationale when you're looking at the airport, what direction is going, and the intent. So really what uh, my intention is is to, first of all, just identify the documents so that you know what you're getting. When I'm done with that, I'm going to give my folder or borrow my folder to your administrator so that all of you and the general public will have access to this information. Now we'll go on from there. The first item is the uh, binding letter of intent, which shows the criteria and the outline of the original proposal by the township to the Doherty's. That was, uh, or showed uh, some numbers that were, were adjusted at the purchase time because they were estimates, 640 acres, 250 acres of, uh, of uh, airport. That's how it went into the findings for uh, the letter of intent. Uh, Dollar-wise, uh, the dollar-wise was $2,150,000 was the total for the total acquisition. Now that number also changed when the purchase order came. And what you'll see is you're gonna get a copy of both the intent and the purchase order. The purchase order identifying the cash down payment of $25,000, $525,000 on uh, May 1st of 98, and the second payment of 508,000 uh, by a contract for deed at $6,030 per month at 7.5%. It's all here. Um, the next item, which is probably of interest, is the capital improvement spreadsheet showing how the money is spent, both by the township and by a MnDOT Aeronautical. Very important. There's commitments here, and you'll be able to see the commitments that were, exp or I shouldn't say maybe commitments. The commitments are the township side of this ledger. The uh, uh, identified items and the spending uh, uh, from the other side of the, uh, the table is the MnDOT's expectations or how they had visualized and how the entire project for not only the purchase, but the future. That's here. 
The next item we have is, um, and we talked about this at the time, but it seems to be misused all or misconstrued uh, how this came down. 40 acres of agricultural property just south of uh, the um, uh, the old uh, landscaper, which you own the property now, that 40 acres was not part of the purchase of the airport property. That was a separate purchase. That property was leased out and owned by another party at the time. And so at a later date, the township attorney addressed this issue with the Doherty's and the, there was conditions placed on the purchase of that property. Um, the Doherty's were protecting the people who leased the property. They were looking at um, a fair equitable value on it and wanted an appraisal on the property. A number of items that uh, were cleanup items on a normal transaction. They also, in, also uh, entered into a lease agreement. And that lease agreement also included the house that was over there for a period of time and identified who's responsible for what. Maintenance, uh, failure of uh, payment, whatever. It's, it's all identified. The next item on, on here is the outline, which is real interesting. It is. Uh, it shows um, the the min dot, both sides of the uh, spreadsheet, or, um, indicating the state's funding, the municipal funding, and the miscellaneous funding. But not not only does it talk about the dollar numbers, but it talks about the project description. And so when they say it's for uh, plans and specifications, fuel system, they've identified where their dollars are going. That's their expectation. On the township side, the township had borrowed money in order to pay for the transaction. The monies to, the, that uh, uh, were used in the transaction coupled with the MnDOT monies to complete the transaction. And a letter in here from the financial uh, lady from the township in here also indicates what their expectations, what fund they were going to use to support it, um, and goes so far as to identify some of the dollar distributions, a, a, a rough penciled in uh, type of a balance. Uh, here's, the, here's the spreadsheet and here's what we've done already. And here's what we expect to do and here's what the balance is gonna be and here's where the money is gonna come from on our side. Everybody's happy, that, that type of thing. The future plans the, for the industrial park was totally laid out and it shows, and there is a mapping in here showing the parcels. Uh, the parcels that are in the airport, four parcels are identified, shown on the map, and they're also pin numbered. So if you wanna look them up, you can look them up. The rest of the parcels in there um, are identified. It looks like there's, well, I'm gonna just take a rough guess, but it looks like there's probably 35 or 40 parcels because these parcels are the ones that um, were identified as industrial park. 
and there's a dollar value that was uh, placed on the parcels, and there's also some description on the parcels themselves. The dollar value for the total was a net of over $5 million. And this was, this was um, given to the township by an outside agency who put value and planning on the project. The engineering firm at the time uh, for the township was Bonestru. They drew up the mapping and, and that portion of it. Um, if I remember correctly, the uh, party that did the appraisal on the property um, was Towel from down in the metropolitan area. Um, they also netted the property. When I say netting the property, that's without the infrastructure, is just the bare land. And that's what accumulated to the $5 million. You'll see the identification listing of all the properties and the price, uh, the mapping showing the lots numbered. Uh, so you, you can track whatever. Now this, a lot of this has changed over the years. For whatever reason it's changed, my, my um, gathering of information uh, basically only uh, pertains to the old township all the way up until the purchase of the, of, of the airport itself. And so the intentions of the township, the mapping, uh, everything was in, in sync with the township. And we all know that uh, after um, the annexation, the, the uh, legal or the judge in there um, identified certain things that had to happen. It wasn't a situation that one community overpowered the other community. It was a joining of the two communities. And, uh, you know, whether the healing has ever taken place, that remains to be seen, but that doesn't make any difference because the legal aspect of this dictates it. And that issue has uh, been kind of uh, out in the forefront in both communities talked about, but never seemed to get to the the table where the numbers and the, and the validity of the statements are backed up by document. And I, I think that's really why I feel very comfortable giving you these documents. It's your job to make the decisions. It's your job to direct the future and it's your job to maintain the airport and the airport property for the community. We all own it. It's all an asset to us and, and we all should be treating all our assets in that way. So what I'm concerned about is, is that unless someone can uh, uh, tell me differently, um, the 40 acres is not part of the airport. The documents tell you that. If you've got another document that says that the airport bought the 40 acres, if they didn't own and don't own it and they didn't buy it, then they shouldn't be getting the revenue. That's simple. That revenue belongs in the general fund, it belongs to the community. Real simple. The other part, folks, I know you've all been here for the last 20 years. I was at the last airport meeting. I'm concerned about the fracture that exists within the airport community, the, the infighting or the non-acceptable 
comments made by people. That, if you can show me any, anything that hasn't gone up in price in the last 20 years, that has gone down, I'd appreciate your information. Originally, the airport property, the hangars were on a monthly rental. I've got the paperwork here and it'll show you what the monthly rental is and the identification of the hangars. Originally, it was 11 cents a square foot. What is it today? 10 cents? 10.3. That seems to me 10.3 is down, not up, down. Why, why, why would anyone in your personal life have an asset that's that valuable and not be, not be taking care of it? It, it's, uh, and I requested at one time before, because I'm, I'm not a, I believe in everyone being fair about their obligations and what they need to do. And one of the fairnesses is, is taxation. I don't care how you look at it, if, if you, uh, taxes are, ta are, are, are placed on you for goods and services rendered. There should be something. You should be getting it, you're paying it. I listen to people come up here and talk about not getting their lights or not getting their water drainage or whatever it is that it doesn't exist, but I'm charged for it. I don't think it's fair. But I don't. I also don't think it's fair when you look at the structure that's out there at the airport. When, the, when Tull came in and said that the property out there is worth, without any infrastructure, a dollar and five cents a square foot per acre. It's not hard to figure out, that's 50 grand an acre. And so when you put the roads and the, and the rest of the items, and also there's a statement in there that says, this, is, this number does not include that all assessments will be paid for by the leaser or the buyer. It's not happening. I've seen some pretty big hits on the uh, financials of uh, the city of Forest Lake for property overrun, project overrun, whatever it is. And I've seen where the discussion has been on maintenance and everything else. And it seems like this is a one-sided deal. And I think that, should, I think that the, the citizens of Forest Lake deserve a fair, a, a fair shake. And I think that, that, that what would be appropriate is if those people who are leasing out there, if that lease property was by use in, in commercial, what would the taxes be? Personal property taxes, very similar to residential. Commercial property taxes, three times residential. So, not only if you're talking about how you're managing the taxpayer's dollars, this is a good example of how we need some change. And these documents are gonna tell you that, and that's the real reason I want. Now, if you've got some documents after the annexation that says things that don't correspond, hey, that's the way government works. They change the rules in the middle of the stream. But these are the documents 
that were applicable at the time of the purchase throughout the entire uh, obligations and, and contractual portion. And so consequently, I hope that you all will get a copy of these. I hope that Dan will make a copy of them and anyone else that wants them so they have good knowledge. Let's not have any more conversation in our community about fairness, who's getting what and what's happening and on and on. We don't need it. But we do need things straightened out and your people can do it. And so I thank you for the opportunity of bringing this forth. If you have any need for any minutes, documents, uh, financials from the old township, let me know. I have them all. We we'll really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, Dick, I do have one question. Yeah. When that purchase took place, was any of that paperwork filed with Washington County? Did what? When, when that purchase took place, did any of that paperwork get filed with Washington County? Well, uh, maybe you buy a house today or whatever. Well, your, your deed gets filed. You know, like. That the entire paperwork was reviewed because it's it's tax exempt, and so there had to be an opinion that came out, and and there is some paperwork in here that identifies that that was done, that the paperwork was completed on it. Now the fact that it was a partial uh, contract for deed portion of it, I, I, can't, I, I can't say yes or no, because so many times a contract for deeds aren't recorded. I mean, they should be, but they're not. And, and uh, especially when you have um, a, 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 an agreement that um, it has a lot of personal feeling in it, and this agreement does. You know, they wanted the naming of the, uh, of the property. They wanted, and it's all in the purchase agreement. Um, you know, and, and I understand because th there's probably only two of us in the world <laughs> that have either the knowledge about it right from the start, and that's myself and Mr. Ashback because we did the uh, the negotiating with the Granis firm from South St. Paul who represented the Doherty's. And so uh, I know Rick probably has a similar rec uh, recall of, of the information, whether he kept it, the documents or not, I don't know. But I'm kind of like a pack rat. I keep putting away everything because I think someday I'll need it. Well, you know, I'm cleaning my office right now and throwing away stuff that's been there 30 years. <laughs> I hope I don't need it. <laughs> but uh, I do, uh, you know, what I'd appreciate is that, that, uh, that you do look at the documents. And if you do have com uh, any comments or, or uh, concerns about uh, any of it, please contact me. You, you, I feel comfortable. Uh, I would be more than happy to answer anything to that date. All right. So I have, a, I have several questions. Pardon me? I have several questions. Sure. You talked about 640 acres was the yeah. total was the total package. Yep. And the total uh, amount was two million one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Correct. Okay, so that's about thirty-eight hundred dollars an acre, give or take a few pennies. Well, the, Sam, the uh, the airport was one transaction with four parcels, and that was that was. Yeah, but I'm talking about the average. That's that was the oh, average yeah. cost. Oh, that okay. may be. That right. could be. And I have the printout here from MnDOT. Okay, I'm not making anything up here. The Forest Lake Airport was purchased in 1998, and here it says 196 acres. You talked about 250 acres. Well, that's what the document says. Okay, that's well, what they. Well, according to MnDOT, it was 196 acres, and the total uh, purchase price at that time 
was $749,200, okay? That's uh, $3,822 an acre. Of that, the state share was four forty nine five twenty, dollars so they paid $2,293 per acre, leaving the, the city share at $1,529 per acre. That's a bargain. And that was one of the reasons why this came, came to be. Uh, also, with this average uh, cost of money uh, along the way, that's what really was it, where the city was able to have ball fields there that were virtually given away, that property. The, it also, uh, uh, Team Vantage is sitting on that property, and, and some, there's other things that has happened to that property since then. There's building, been buildings going on and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Also, one of the things that that's kind of been bugging me here a little bit, uh, the total amount of money that the state of Minnesota has pumped into the Forsyth Airport is five million one hundred and fifty one thousand three hundred and three dollars. Excuse me. For what? That's the total amount of money that the state has brought into this into the Forsyth Airport, and that that includes the feasibility study, the purchase of the airport, the John Deere tractor and mower, the wetland delineation, above ground fuel facility. There's, there's about a dozen items here, including the runway. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify a couple things, that w you know, with what you had compared to what's on this piece of paper directly from MnDOT. Well, I'm sure. Because what I have from MnDOT doesn't match what the purchase order is either. Yeah. Because they've allocated the monies that they are putting in in a different place and under a different, sure. and not, on, uh, not as land purchase. The other thing, the other thing too that, uh, no, so that, you know, we can go over these numbers. I'd be happy to do that with you and get the whole thing straightened out. Well, that's but, I don't want any, but I don't want any misconception or misquotes or, or changes in any way. We want the truth. Everybody wants the truth. And so uh, I'd be happy to share this piece of paper with you and you can compare it with your notes and uh, go, go from there. Also, one time there was a comment made about uh, when we built the AD building out there. Uh, it was kind of an interesting thing because a gentleman came up and said, uh, well, the AD building cost the city of Forest Lake $300,000. And then the quote was, you should know, Sam, you built it. Well, first of all, I did not build it, okay? And what I did is uh, that that's, is right here, um, the AD building and fuel system relocation. The total cost of that job was uh, $320,819. The state share was 240397 That left a city share or the local share at 80422 But the other part of that equation was it was a private benefactor who supplied $50,000 toward that project. The total cost for moving the gas and that AD building, 30422 and I just want to just want to make those things absolutely well, clear. Sam, and, that uh, uh, that information that you have and that you just uh, uh, repeated um, is information after the annexation. Of course it is. It's of course all, it is. All, sure. And 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 it was the obligation of the city to inform the public of any misinformation that's out there. My information is not information after the annexation. It is the information that purchased yeah, but the it property. Out, but, it, but it starts out with a total. That's, that's all I'm getting at. It's just Pardon a, me? It, it starts out with a total amount of money, $2,150,000. I mean, that's where it starts. Because that was the total, oh, the total you, purchase. You mean for the... The total package. Total, total package, package is, is what the purchase order, a purchase agreement says. Right. That's all. Two million one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, and I know that there were some agreements between the township and Doherty's and all that at that time, you know, about making sure that the airport stayed. And uh, but it, there's been a lot of money that's been gone into the airport that isn't necessarily city money. There's uh, there's uh, the private. Uh, investment out there right now is about $6 million. Every one of those hangars pay taxes along with the lot rent, every single one of them. 
also the state is, in, like I said before, they pumped in over $5 million. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands this big picture of how that thing works. The rest of that property is all, in fact, is there's still 122 acres that the city owns that's for sale. And so um, we got to look at the total uh, situation to make a final, some sort of a determination on what, who's paying what. Well, I think that, uh, that that's exactly what um, uh, our, the rationale for bringing this information forward was to give you a basis as to what took place prior to the annexation. Now, I know what took place after, and I know uh, what's happening now, and does that correlate with what the int original intentions of uh, the purchase? That's a question, and if it, it, and if it does, uh, it does. If it doesn't, there should be some rationale for the, why it doesn't. And in the, the fact that, uh, that uh, the monies have been put in there, into the airport, you know, uh, if I put money into a building or my house, that's my obligation. I don't ask the city of uh, residents to pick up the tab. No, and, 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 and the, the, any asset that the city has, whether it's a city hall or the fire equipment or the police, whatever, they're all protected assets. And they should be. And so should private assets. Pardon me? And so should private assets be protected. Oh, of course. And, you know, but, you, but the, point, the point is that you're paying personal property tax on a bill building that you own. And you have not seen increases in your lease on the land in 20 years. That's they're, real clear, Sam. They're private hangers. Pardon paying, me? They're private hangers paying taxes plus the lot rent. This if you put the, if you is, put your not, building you commercial. put the building you put the building on a piece of commercial property, do you think you'd get by that easy? It's, of course it's, not. It's, it's completely. This really isn't the time for it. It this. is too. He, he, uh, but, I mean, uh, Mr. Cheetah's presenting some information. That's why I'm we trying to clarify. We haven't had the time to review it at, okay. so. We're trying to we're, tra we're trying to yeah. clarify a couple things. That's all. Yeah. Well, I don't think any of us can clarify until we have a chance to review it. And uh, these are documents the city doesn't have in their possession at the moment. So, um, you know, I appreciate all the time. Thank you, you put for in your to time. And anyway. uh, like I said before, I'll be glad to supply you with any documentation that supports this. All right. Well, thank you very much. Townships and piggy bank. You got a plane. Uh, Mr. Cheetah. Mr. Cheetah. Were you going to present that to the attorney or to Dan? Pass it. I'll pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Have it all responsible. <laughs> Donovan, uh, do you want to take us through the comp plan? Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, members of council, like to present to you um, the draft. 2040 comprehensive plan update. Um, this um, process began in October of 2017. Um, and then we had a April 17, I'm sorry, October of 2016, April 17 open house in which these words appeared as the kind of the, the words that kind of resonated with people on what they saw for 2040. Um, and the process, I'd like to describe a little bit of the process, um, and also um, direct some of my comments to um, you know, the, the issues that Ms. Ms. Young raised in the open forum, and, and, and also addressing other comments I've received from residents. Um, as I mentioned, the plan uh, was kicked off um, with a joint city council, city um, say plan commission workshop in, in 2016. We had an open house in 2017, multiple workshops with city council, Plan Commission and uh, EDA, and then uh, Arts in the Park, Bluegrass, 
festival booths. Um, we've had some presentations at the high school and the senior center. Um, there was a, there were four planning commission task me force meetings in 2017 in which we had representatives of city council and the business community and the school district um, come together and begin to uh, narrow down some of the issues, identify some large goals, and also um, during that time we held a, a community survey which queried residents on where they saw things for 2014, uh, goods and services they wanted to see in the community, that sort of thing. Uh, a series of community conversations in January and February of this year. Um, all along we've had some newspaper articles, Facebook posts, public presentations. Um, we had two public hearings at the Planning Commission on June 27th and July 11th, and then on July 11th the Planning Commission voted, voted to recommend plan approval. So there have been um, a long series of meetings, um, outreach efforts, and I think that, you know, there's, I have a, in your, in your packets there was a full uh, comp, um, description of different um, changes within each of the, the um, chapters of the uh, comprehensive plan. I'd like to focus now on what I think has been the, the biggest change and then also kind of what, um, where I've been receiving uh, resident feedback, some re resident feedback. And, uh, and this also represents the biggest uh, step forward for the, the, the city to em embrace the future. Um, and, this, and this relates to economic development. That uh, kind of the, the purplish um, zone here, this is a future land use plan, so this is draft. And this would be preceding the actual zoning, zoning map. But in this case, um, we started off with, you know, a recognition that around, you know, basically economic growth in Forest Lake re requires land. Land's really not available in the, that Broadway Avenue um, interstate area. We have wetlands, it's built out. Um, they're, they're obviously, 2040, our retail environment is going to be much different than we see today. And so some of what we see is the big box retail, the big land consumers, there could be some big shifts there, and that, those could um, be f some future job areas. Well, where do we look, what we can see right now, looking at that crystal ball? Let's look to the south, southwest. Um, 35E comes up here, and currently uh, in, in the city of Hugo and Anoka County's transportation plans, they imagine an interstate access at 170th Street. Um, well, as we, we doing more analysis and study for what Forest Lake would like, we looked at what if there was a freeway access at 180th, right here, right, this, the southern boundary of the city. However, of course, the access wouldn't be in Forest Lake boundaries itself. It's either in Columbus or Anoka, basically on the line, um, if you extend 180th Street outward. Well, currently, it's a lot of ag agricultural use, of vacant land, um, some residential use, and so the city first began with the idea that there would be a highway business. And uh, the, land, the land use category um, is described as, this land is guided for, uh, for businesses that require proximity to the regional transportation infrastructure, such as warehousing, wholesaling, e-commerce, light manufacturing, and data centers. So this is projected to be a, you know, the job center for 2040. And again, I wanna stress, this is, the, this is a long range plan. Um, and this also is really dependent on the city making its case to the, you know, to Anoka County, to Washington County, to Hugo, to Lino Lakes and, and Columbus, that this would be in the best interest of all of these um, jurisdictions. Um, and one reason we think um, that, that argument is persuasive is because if you look at 170th, there are a number of large, uh, smaller parcels. Um, uh, this would anticipate a flyover, a road going from 35E over to 35W, which we currently don't have. If, if you want to do any kind of turnaround, you're stuck with going up to Highway 97 and turn around if you're going from you know, northbound 35E to southbound 35W. And um, you're going through wetlands and parkland, um, which are really almost either cost prohibitive or just regulatorily um, really difficult to put a road improvement within a park or wetlands, and that would be an elevated highway. And so, what this land use plan is anticipating um, is that interstate access, you know, for this um, 
highway business type land use. Also, what's important to note here is that this is the, uh, this is the, this is the map showing the, um, the Musa staging line. Now, any attempt to get, to get federal highway access, we're looking at um, 12, 15, 10, 12, 15 years. Um, it is not a quick process. Right now, this is not even on MnDOT's radar. It's something of an uphill climb to get this. Um, but um, this could be uh, really a, you know, a, the job center for Forest Lake in 2040 if it does occur. Um, and this, what you see before you is a staging plan that has the, these tan areas represent the expected MUSA, ex the service, urban services boundary, um, where the city expects these areas in tan to be, for city water and sewer to be extended. And so we don't, even at this point, say by 2030 that this would have this kind of e-commerce, wholesaling, data center type use. And if you kind of add 15 to 2018, you get 2033. So um, is any kind of uh, possible time where that, um, that inter, uh, interstate interchange could be realized? And so, you know, this is what I've been stressing with uh, residents. This is a long use um, land use plan, um, long range, and that we're not anticipating this happening anytime soon. And what will follow up with the zoning would also reflect that, that we want to, you know, allow um, current uses, but not make um, long, not, do, not to do the zoning, which follows the comprehensive plan update uh, adoption. We don't want to um, have the zoning do anything to take away this, this future, possible futures of 2040 job center. However, um, we can also in the future, if the interchange um, is not going to be realized, there's a chance to go back and take a look at this again and think, what, what is the best use of this? Um, also here tonight is Jane Concierge from Bolton & Mank, um, who's also um, provided you know, vital um, assistance with the preparation of this plan. And uh, so at this point, I could, go, I could go through the next, through my PowerPoint, or I could just, um, you know, with the council's uh, direction, um, or we could stop here and, and happy to take any questions. I don't know if there's any questions yet. Um, I know Columbus is matching their um, zoning with ours in accordance with this. And, um, you know, not only is, is you know, 180th, um, you know, something I consider vital to our future economic growth, it's probably the only large undeveloped area within the metro um, counties that it really has a lot of potential if, if we can get um, an exit put there. And um, we are gonna have to take the lead on that and you know, come up with the right strategy to get that done. Um, MnDOT definitely doesn't want to add passenger miles to their road, but I think the logic here is that you know, having employment centers here is really gonna take passenger miles off of there um, as residents aren't gonna have to drive that 30 miles each way to the city. So, um, it, it has a lot of potential for us, for the county, just for growth and employment in general. So um, I'm, I'm really glad to see it in here. Um, Susan, I, you were on one of the comp plan committees, but we also had other committees, other people. I know we sat, uh, Donovan, with you, and there were several people. I know um, from other, uh, from the planning commission, I don't know if anybody was from the parks at that when we, you know, looked at these and, and reviewed them. So there there was discussion within the city as well on this. So if there's any, not any other question for Donovan, I'm, if not, let's go ahead and keep going through it. Okay. Um, I also want to clarify too, um, you know, some of the concerns of residents who, who see this as, um, you know, not consistent with their expectations. Um, and have some concerns about how far north that goes. Um, but uh, I'd like to then go through basically um, some of the, the main changes um, shown with this plan. And um, also the goals, um, just gives more of the, similar with the framework um, that relate to natural resources and um, 
land use, transportation plan, and economic development to really kind of bring a kind of a comprehensive vision to this, the 2040 um, Forest Lake. The, um, sorry, the, uh, firstly, with the uh, land use significant changes, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the highway business land use category in the Southwest, um, we have an expansion of the, the, the uh, co commercial and, um, areas along Highway 61 and also in, along Broadway. Um, to, to create deeper lots on Broadway to make them more ripe for commercial development. Um, and also on the residential side, um, expansion of the low medium density re residential east of Highway 61, um, and understanding that if we expand the, the business area in one side of 61 and the west side, that southwest, that uh, we should accommodate that also, um, you know, t t take the place of it, uh, accommodate that on the east side of 61. And then um, also increase the residential density in downtown and in mid, low mid-density areas. This is something that the Planning Commission recommended um, in order to accommodate more um, you know, options for affordable housing and also current development trends, um, to maybe looking more to that 11,000 square foot lot um, rather than the 15. Um, and then, as I mm. mentioned, the, the future land use plan, and then also the staging plan um, and then the big change with transportation um, is that interstate interchange envisioned, which of course is not in the forest, city of Forest Lake. But the Donovan, can I interrupt? Just sure. go back first for land use, but clarify a couple things. I think uh, when we were talking downtown, uh, one of the changes was around um, the lake for potential of more condominium uses and the properties we have now. Uh, was that included in this final plan? Do you mean on that kind of northeast section? Correct, yeah. Yes, that's included. Okay. Um, and the actual uses would, would be more part of the, 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 the rezoning that'll occur following the sure. adoption of this plan. And then just to clarify, um, where we run into zoning, you know, land zoning changes, it's not in the middle of a road, but it's thousand feet off or something like that or approximately yes. Yeah. So, so we don't end up with one side mixed use commercial and the other side something else or whatever so correct I think that's one of the big okay. lessons we learned in the you know with the current plan all right and Thank you on. did that throughout right that's that's throughout all zones right correct okay thank you a uh, quick question go ahead um regards to the highway business there is not a road running right down um divides would be the park and uh your rural residential with your highway business? Um, which area is a little more specific, I guess? Uh, bottom corner here. Where you start your highway business on, is that a road front that we're using the? Nope, that's like a thousand feet in or something on a road, isn't it? In the southwest corner. It looks that way on the north-south line, but not the east-west line. Oh, yeah. That looks like a road right there. So yeah, right where your cursor's at. Is that a road? Not currently. Do we have that design for a road? The, um, we have a rough approximation of the extension of highway, of Headwaters Parkway, you know, veer south there to avoid this, the whole, this whole wetland area there. So this is basically that green um, curvilinear line is Headwaters Parkway and it's envisioned to go down here to connect with Elmcrest in the future. But on the north, that's just wetlands then? Yes. Yes. Okay. There's currently a, a road where Elmcrest makes that turn. Um, we got parkland to the north of the road and directly to the south road. South of the road, we have uh, the highway business. Correct. Um, kind of Well, it's not a road. Area. It's actually a driveway at the moment, but... So you're asking, should we adjust that slightly to cover both sides? Yeah, we talked about wanting to get that business park in there. Um, so you want to move that line like 500 feet to the north or something, or just so we get both sides of the road covered? I mean, currently it's it's not a road. There, you know, this this northern line that's that's big wetland complex. It'd be difficult to, you know, develop that. Okay. Um, 
moving eastward here though it goes all the way through to uh that's where it runs south of the roundabout by Leela, right yeah Fenway I don't know if it's going to hinder us if we um put more residential on that line that way you're not looking one side of the streets the house is the other side of the streets your business park right no that's what we wanted to park try and avoid that, so. maybe put the business park in that backyard more or less mm -hmm. I think residential would be a little nicer to have around our park area. You know, people going there for business don't really appreciate that as much as one of their big drawing points. The Forest Lake is all of our, um, you know, it's it's not that city feel. Just trying to picture that. What's that? No, I'm just trying to picture where that is. So this is the, the that, that divine line between that the, the low medium density residential and then the highway business. Right here, and this is a, a privately owned driveway, privately maintained. Okay. For this residence. I think where uh, where Blaine's pointing out is He's right, right at. Are you right? Okay, that is the right corner. Yeah, and then it runs all the way all the way through here to Fenway Avenue. Yeah. As far as this is now, business park, all the way to Fenway on the corner. Or highway business when we wanna. Move it slightly south. I don't think that would affect our. Yeah. And then maybe offer a different trunk for the uh, highway business. So when we do put a road through here, uh, the highway business will be coming a different route, not necessarily through the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You're still going to have neighborhood to the north. Yeah. And you don't want those trucks going through the neighborhood. That's one of the things we didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Didn't want with that that traffic going through neighborhoods. Yeah, no, I like that idea. Can we make that adjustment on there then? I can follow up with you. Get the, I, I'm not understanding the line, but we can. Yeah, yeah after the meeting, you can point it out to him. But. Sure, so we'll come back to it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So. Uh, can you, yeah, Donovan, can you back up a second to the change in density along the, the downtown? I believe the mayor mentioned that's the property that's near the lake. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, the for the multi, for condominiums. Yeah, well, I'm a little confused. Um, well, we're trying to we're trying to have a meeting. The the reason I'm asking or bringing it up is I think Donovan just made a statement when he referenced it that it also would help in affordable housing, but I don't believe you put affordable housing along the most valuable property in the city. Uh no, but I think that was for some others that were off of the lake. I just it, yeah it's, it's it's yeah it's completely um all the residential density in downtown is the downtown mix is high density it's it's a downtown mixed use area. Um, We're just bringing that area north a little bit more. Yeah yeah up by Sixth uh, Street um, northeast. I'm sorry Sixth Avenue. Um, but the uh, other other piece is to allow for more developer flexibility. I mean. It's not that the um, if a developer decides not to do 11,000 square foot, I mean, this is, again, this is more the details of the rezoning piece, but um, it's just a lot more developer flexibility, basically. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think part of that came with, uh, with Gon's new building is kind of on the edge of where we can develop right now. So looking at, you know, is that same type of product going to continue to grow to the north of there a little bit? Okay. All right. Any other questions on the, the zoning part, or should we move on to transportation? Let's go ahead and move on down. Here. And so, as I mentioned, the, um, the interchange uh, is envisioned, and also there's more of an emphasis on uh, transportation as a, um, it, I'm sorry, bicycles as a mode of transportation. As far as parks and trails, um, the biggest change is that we're looking at, um, you know, as some sort of planned trail that would en encircle Forest Lake, going through this area. And again, I'll stress this is, you know, 2040 plan. This is for, you know, the, the you know, some of us will be here and the 8,000 people we expect to come by 2040 and having areas built out where some of these will follow um, anticipated transportation routes. Like I mentioned, that extension of Headwaters Parkway going south of the of the um, 
of that you know, wetlands complex over by Elmcrest. Um, and also some, some more connections with um, the Harbor Creek Trail and also understanding that you know, in the next few years, um, uh, 11th Avenue Southwest will be reconstructed along with um, Everton and take advantage of that to add a trail and also trying to create more connectivity. Um, you know, one big piece would be here if along 50, if this head over to Big Marine Park and then um, was able to actually loop back around up through Hugo and to the Harbor Creek Trail, um, be a, big, a great amenity for, uh, for bicyclists and other rollers and walkers. Um, and also I should mention that the, uh, the Parks, Lakes and Trails Commission did review their, um, the Parks and Trails chapter and uh, recommended approval of it at their last meeting. All right, a couple of questions for you. Can you stay on that page, Donovan? Sure. Ed. A uh, question I have is, did you reach out to like Hugo and Columbus and our surrounding communities to make sure our trails systems aligns with their comp plan? Um, that is something I'm working on now. Um, we, you know, we did show, for instance, this like snowmobile trail through here. Um, we have a we have a contact over in the you know Scandia Engineering Department who's provided this you know this connectivity here. I'm talking. I'm referring to Mr. Goodman there. Um, so we know how that works, and we also took the, kind of the you know the uh, kind of assumed that also we'd see this along here. And part of what the vision is for this corridor is that Hornsby Elmcrest does become a county road, um, <coughs> and so we see you know that carrying a lot more traffic and having that sort of trail amenities there as well. Um, but, uh, you know, right now we're also in the process of, of looking at Hugo's plans and, um, and Columbus's, and so I'll be doing that review as well. Um, and this, really tonight, I should say that the ask is to, you know, authorize staff to submit this to the adjacent jurisdictions for their review. Um, because this is not a actual a formal adoption time until we've got the review from the adjacent jurisdictions, the watershed districts, um, the school district, et cetera, even um, those uh, areas north in Chicago County, Chicago Township are, um, are listed, our, our, our list of jurisdictions to uh, set our plan to, to you know, seek um, their review and any comments. Okay. And one more question. Uh, when they were, I think it was MnDOT was out here talking about the uh, express bus trail or bus road, a dedicated road that would run along the trail. Is that taken into consideration anywhere? In that is, um, it's in the plan. Um, I see along 97. But um, no, the one that's supposed to go along 61 is going down towards St. Paul. Current plan is connector bus only to White Bear Lake from Forest Lake. Hmm. Now that's not that. That's not a 2040 plan. That's a more near-term plan, but I'm that just would be curious, connector bus that, only. I hate to see us plan, and then they're planning, and the, what, the trail that we think is going to be there won't be there. Good point. Yeah, the trail we just built gets torn up. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, every time, you know, if any sort of improvement was there, um, there would probably be co-location. And, you know, in my conversations with the, um, the rush line, the rush line corridor, um, given the uh, kind of demand for um, the service up here, you know, that kind of a real dedicated busway, um, it's going to take a long time to, to get that sort of, to warrant that kind of investment. Um, and I can, I, can, I can see that just staying on Highway 61 in the future. I, I don't think that would be, anyone would see it as a good use to dedicate all of the Harbor Creek Trail for that. Even though, I mean, it's legally they could do that, but given just what the ridership would be and how much it would cost, uh, it seemed to make more sense to coordinate that with MnDOT and just keep that in Highway, Highway 61. I was just concerned because I know they ruled out light rail any, anywhere in the near future, and I believe they ruled out buses running on existing, like 35. Correct. That's correct. And then their final solution to it, I was left with, eventually they'd like to have a dedicated roadway with stops along the way for dedicated buses. But it sure looked like they were presenting it to in the same area. Yeah, so well, right. Now, I mean, right now that's not part of the project because they um, they either, as far as the, the FTA um, application, can only include 
you know, the, the stations for a fixed, like a, a rap, bus rapid transit or a, or a rail, you know, steel wheel vehicle. Um, and, you know, that was one of the things we thought we might get some sort of improvement, but then at the end, it came down to, you know, what was going to be part of the application is just everything up to White Bear Lake, you know, um, and not anything north of there. And so it would have to ba basically revive that whole process again and, you know, do all the study to get anything coming north of White Bear. And it's, you know, that just even to get that point, get to the point where they are now with the study, that's probably been 15 years. I mean, I worked on that as a private consultant in 2008. You know, and it's still alive and finally getting some sort of fruition, but I can't imagine this coming, maybe this comes up by 2040 and, but, you know, maybe we'll have to make some changes in 2030, but right now, um, for, downtown Forest Lake does exist as a potential transit terminus for these express buses with a stop, of course, at the Harwood Creek Transit Center. Um, but uh, I think our plan does represent what the reality is, is that we're not going to see anything, you know, within this, within the next 10 years, definitely, that would, you know, be different than what you see now. I've got a couple of, or just clarification, but um, looking at the, the amount of trails that are proposed on here, and um, especially in the uh, the northeast quadrant, that new trail that kind of completes a loop around the lake. Oh, uh huh. Uh, so uh, no, on the other side, yeah, that one right there. So uh, right where it turns ninety degrees. Um, no, on the other side, on the other end. Are you? There you go, right there. And now I see two trails in Scandia that are, you know, one of them is less than a mile away. I'm just, I'm wondering. You know, why are we building, you know, three or four um, bike trails so close to each other when, you know, there isn't a very significant population there? Um, you know, would it be a lot better to work with Scandi and just run that trail, you know, the half mile or whatever it is to connect there than it is to, you know, run it all the way back down to uh, 97? And then, again, as you look a little higher that, you got another trail coming off of there um, virtually parallel to the other trails that I see. So I'm just, you know, looking at benefit and then, you know, long term we have to pay to maintain all these trails. And so I'd rather see trails that are getting used and, and that are, are um, workable rather than, you know, having to struggle to see which one we're going to maintain or, you know, how many of them we're going to have um, cracked up concrete or asphalt that we can't pay to maintain so you know I think that area needs to be consolidated to become a realistic plan can I add on to that so so um, the ability to get around the lake though is frequent feedback and my yep. concern on not us not including that downward part as at least part of our plan is it makes us then dependent on Scandia to make their two pieces um, I think in function when it comes time to actually doing it, it makes sense to have that conversation, but I'm not sure I want us to be dependent on Scandia making that loop. Well, and I would assume That's Scandia like, can't, you know, isn't going to afford to do that, I mean, with their population base there, so right. it would be Washington County anyway that would well, be building or those trails. Whoever, whoever does so, it. So, you know, however we coordinate it, but yeah, somehow it'd be nice to bring those into one trail. I'd, I'd like to see us at least have it as part of our plan. Um, just so that we are showing intent, um, agree in function when it comes time. If it moves a little bit over to the right, I don't think anyone has a problem with that, but I'd like to see it at least continue in our plan. Yeah, because there can't even be a quarter mile difference between where they hit 97 anyway, so. Um. Correct, the next one is Manning, is that right? Yes. Is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that's Manning. I don't think that's going right. anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions for Donovan on this section? Let's keep rolling for it. Um, as far as housing, um, the, uh, the changes that we see, um, this is some, uh, actually with uh, this language that would allow for the um, separate ex accessory dwelling units. Um, currently the code only allows it within the single family home. Um, I've received many, many um, requests for you know, options for either, you know, adult children who require a little more supervision, um, who could live on the homestead with the parents, um, 
to, of course, I mean, to uh, people looking for just a, a different uh, housing type. Um, and of course, that the, the details of that would be part of in kind of rezoning. Um, but the, there is, you know, guiding language currently in the housing plan for this. Um, also expanding owner-occupied senior housing options. And um, there are just, is a change from the, the 2010 plan, just fewer plan, um, the plan adopted in 2010 is fewer plan objectives promote affordable housing production. There, there, there is a list of resources within this comp plan. The, um, as far as economic competitiveness. Uh, one question on that, multiple dwellings. Mm -hmm portion of that is that a temporary multiple dwelling or would that be permanent no that would be this is um i envision that related to the accessory dwelling unit so no it would not be temporary but it would be um it would be allowing a second you know a second dwelling unit on a on a lot where currently that's not allowed unless you're in a pud situation and you know completely different development scale would there be a minimum lot size to allow that? Or? There could be. That, that would, that, that's what we would get down to nitty gritty with in, in details of that. And it's something that I think it would be worthy of discussion. And if it's ultimately the city decides to take a different route, you know, that's what we could do. But um, I think it's important at least to have the option. I have a question on the way the wording is. Uh, and it says fewer plan objectives to promote affordable housing production. Is that saying? We want less affordable housing? No, no, I'm or sure. Or is that saying we want to remove obstacles to affordable housing? What is it saying? Well, I'm saying this is a much simpler housing plan, housing chapter. Um, the, the, the last plan adopted had a really extensive housing chapter. Um, and it had a long list of kind of a, a, sh um, a list for different ways for the city to pursue you know, affordable housing options. Um, the, the current housing chapter, you know, doesn't have a, that, those full set of goals. Um, when I looked at those, I saw the city wasn't putting much resources into that, um, and there are other ways to, to tackle that. And basically, here I'm reporting. I'm not promoting one way or the other. I'm just reporting that this current draft chapter has fewer plan objectives. And when you say affordable, is that low income housing, or is that just more affordable market rate housing? Um, Really, the, the housing chapter doesn't, uh, as far as goals, doesn't distinguish between that. Um, like you know, affordable meaning like, subsidized. correct, yeah. You know, I mean, there's there's definite goals for you know what we, we would call low income housing. You know, down to the thirty percent affordable level. Um, I think most of the, most of the uh, what we you know throughout the plan, we're more at that sixty or eighty percent affordable for you know area area medium income. Um, and so, I mean, to get the real, you know, low, low income, that does require some sort of subsidy. Either it's coming from, you know, the city, the county, the state, um, or land trust. And that's something that, you know, we don't distinct, we don't have a goal separate for that. Okay. Thank you. I still got a question on the uh, separate accessory units. Are we talking a bunkhouse for lake properties, a guest house for estates? Or, I mean, what, what other accessory units you're talking about on basically a separate structure I mean maybe it's it's a you know um, you know kind of a, you know the grand suite above above a detached garage okay um, maybe it's a you know it's a more of a a smaller scale or even tiny house that's also on the property you know detached from the house but I mean currently you can have about 600 square feet of you know an accessory dwelling unit within a single-family home but most people find that's not enough to really to serve them. Um, and so this, and, and they do, I think they do, they do want a separation, a, d a different structure. And so I'm responding to those, those requests. And, um, you know, as far as the details, we'll, we'll, we'll get deep into that and, you know. Do you have a size in mind, a, a minimum size, or I'm sorry, a maximum size in mind of what that would look like? I don't. I mean, it really, you know, the comp plan is really that kind of helicopter view. Um, so and I think it's to, yeah, it's, yeah, we're not at that detail level yet. To Thank you for clarifying okay. that. Okay. All right. Other questions? Well, let's keep on rolling. Um, and uh, economic competitiveness chapter includes, uh, 
you know, some mentioned that, you know, like to work toward uh, allowing home businesses that don't impact um, near, nearby properties and ex accessory to residential use, which currently are home occupations. Um, but perhaps as, you know, nature of work changes that there may be some more things, um, other ways to accommodate that within residential districts. <coughs> um, and we have more language to attract and encourage new light residential, office, industrial, high tech, and professional services. And uh, we had lots of design criteria within the last economic competitive chapter, which also in active trying to simplify things, um, we don't have that, that text or, or uh, pictures, images within this plan. Um, and also with community facilities planning, um, we still re retain um, this idea of a, set, a, a site of a potential second fire station um, <coughs> over by the intersection of Highway 97 and North Shore Trail. That's potentially. Um, and then also a site of potential public works facility um, in down toward the end of the, the highway, um, I'm sorry, the, the airport runway. And um, that is it as far as a summary of the, the large changes. I'd be happy to take any questions from the city council. I don't see site of future um, water tower. Is that something you would typically put in? That um, also does require a lot more detailed analysis. Right. Um, right. And we've talked about that at different, different um, and it's in some ways as far as, um, you know, as soon as we could determine that site, we should identify it so that it kind of becomes part of the landscape and so it's not a big thing. But um, that, I think a lot of that does relate to um, land elevation and, uh, you know, of course, the, the site of, you know, where the locus of the future development is. Ryan, do you want to say anything more about that? <clears throat> within the water resource chapter, there's a broken down water supply chapter and within their references to appendixes, which is your water supply plan. And then the water study that was done in 2015, the water supply plan was done in 16. So that's where a lot more okay. detail would be. Basically what's in the comp plan, what's submitted to all the agencies is your overall potential water usage and planning at a high, high level. More detail you would want to see is in those two uh, attachments in the appendix that we were just asking about. Perfect. Thank you. I just got it. All right. Any other questions for Donovan? I have a question. I watched the. Uh, maybe you can. Are you done with this presentation? Sure. Yes, yes, I am. Yes. I watched the planning commission meeting that you had, and you presented in front of them also. But they came up with a suggestion about changing density. Could you explain that to me? Sure. Um, the we folk in the planning commission um, conversations. We focused on a chapter. I'll I'll bring it up. Um, that related to uh, land use density. And again, this is just a planned density. Um, and the, um, uh, is for, for planning purposes, it doesn't, doesn't require actually development to follow um, the, the full, let's say, you know, higher density level, and it's all presented in ranges. Um, and, Where am I going? <clears throat> Sorry, my Adobe is not cooperating. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Page 20. <laughs> so what the um, Planning Commission focused on was looking at this. Um, of course, is low density here changing us to um, potentially um, four units per acre. Um, this is often the area that's around basically now single family, zone, which is zoned single family. Um, that's what it was translated into d during the rezoning. But uh, the Planning Commission wanted to get a little, um, some more options. Um, 
And this is also an area where, you know, currently there's, it is in, in the past it was translated into 15,000, basically a third of acre lots. And what if the potential would be more of a quarter acre lot there? Um, so you'd be talking, if I remember the conversation, is like you'd have 55 foot lots about? Um, well, no, more about the, like 11,000 square foot is what I recall. And, and that's getting really deep into the details of it. You know, I mean, this is, um, you know, the, the rezoning would, would be where this would actually take place. And um, this is, a, so this is more of a guiding thing, which and I, you know, an option perhaps for flexibility for developers, for people to perhaps in the, maybe in the future do some lot splits they couldn't do now. And also, you focused on increasing the, the downtown mixed use zoning up to uh, 25 unit um, maximum density, where currently this is 10 to 15. And so this is the area we can see, and this is where, you know, in the, with Cherwood Point and also with Lighthouse Lofts, we're seeing densities, basically, you know, 22 dwelling units per acre, or 28, um, I think Lighthouse Lofts is, is 28. Um, so this is right in there, and those were achieved for, through, you know, through a PUD process. So we're trying to incorporate that, kind of the market reality of that into this downtown area with the, that increased density. But if I understand you correctly, just because we have it in our comp plan doesn't mean you have to, you would still have to be a conditional use, or? Oh, correct, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, that it would still involve that sort of, um, you know, planning commission or, you know, city council review, of course. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Donovan? If not, uh, let's go on to the uh, temporary non-commercial sign text amendment. Um, I am looking for a motion from City oh, Council. You do need a motion on this one. Yes, sir. What we're seeking is basically authorization to send it out to a, you know the, the what they call affected jurisdictions, which are the adjacent you know municipalities, counties, watershed district. Um, school district, um, areas north, outside the metro, um, to get their feedback. And that becomes then, we bring it back to a council for actual formal adoption and then, you know, authorization to submit to Met Council. Okay. So I have a, I have a question. So you mentioned um, we have consensus with Columbus on the 180th interchange. Where are we with Hugo or um, Anoka County? Are there, uh, is there a consensus or alignment there? What does so that look like? We're still like? in the kind of planning stages. Uh, Lionel Lakes is okay with it, but neither Lionel Lakes or Anoka County want to take the lead on the project because mm -hmm. obviously there's funding involved in it. Mm -hmm. Hugo um, has had 170th in their comp plan for about 80 years <laughs> and they've never done a single thing with it and they're still not doing anything with it and it's it's physically it, it would be so co costly as to not make it a reality ever so that's kind of where we're at and obviously i can see where hugo doesn't want to give up that hope of getting right. another interchange but you know they have a lot going on down there and you know this is this is mainly a focus on the location and not if that interchange gets built in a different location like 180th they really lose the accessibility to 35w yeah. so it's as much a factor of we need an interchange <coughs> as we need an interchange at that particular location because it's the only location that it really has the the impact that it would it would gather, you know, and you can look at where 35E and W come together mm -hmm. on the south side of the cities. Yep. Um, you know, there's no reason eventually that couldn't be the same as what we're looking at up here anyway. So, so Hugo's not going to include it in their comp plan, a 180th interchange, is that mm -hmm. correct? Um, Lionel Lakes, are they open to doing it? Is they're, it de they're definitely open to it, and, and for them, um, you know, either one is about the same benefit to them. Um, they would have a one eightieth be better because it gives them the W access. Well, one hundred seventieth is is you know drawn going straight through Lionel okay. Lakes, where one hundred eightieth would enter the freeway and then exit again on the next 
road. Mm -hmm. um, again, much more cost effective to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But I don't see the east-west traffic flow um, that many cars per day versus the north-south traffic flow. So it's not like um, you know a regional road that's that's going to carry fifty or eighty thousand cars a day. Right. Mm -hmm. So help me then. So on the next so next steps, um, the so comp plan gets approved and then we reassess zoning. What timing would we be looking at to change zoning to that south that highway business in that southwest? Like, is that a twenty nineteen zoning change? Is that a we? Some to other point, when, when do we actually consider it? And I'll just jump to my, my concern is, I think that interchange, if it's going to be successful, is gonna require some consensus among local communities. Um, that's undetermined right now, and I'm, I guess I'm just nervous on making the commitment to the zoning change if there's still some pretty significant unknowns there. And I'm, so I'm trying to decide, you know, t timing of comp plan approval versus when are we making the impact, because that is, material impact to those residents that live there today. Um, and so I'm just trying to line up that timing in my mind. Sure. Um, well, the, you know, our schedule is to submit this, uh, you know, adopted comp plan in, in April, uh, March of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, Met Council says in nine months we should complete our rezoning. So it puts us somewhere around, you know, early 2020. Um, but the, uh, the actual, you know, the purpose of the uh, comp plan in, this, in the future land use map as you, plan as you see is it's, it's a planning document. Um, and the actual, you know, construction of interchange is something of an implementation of that. And it's the, the timeline for that is, is, is way out there. Um, the way, I mean, I think in some ways, you know, just looking at Hugo and how they've dealt with it, they've, you know, as the mayor mentioned, it's been part of their plan for a really long time, and they've zoned it um, to still accommodate the current uses, um, but you know, with kind of triggers, you know, with the idea that in, in the future, if there's parcel consolidation and the, the interchange is built, then um, there's, uh, um, you know, then you know, then the zoning will get in line and, and support that. Um, the big the big reason to make this plan is to kind of say to, you know, to the, um, other jurisdiction, you know, local jurisdictions, the counties, MnDOT, um, federal government, that we're serious about this. This is we're, we're planning for a future where we do require it, inter, you know, that interstate access. Um, and so, in some ways, it's almost like a chicken egg, egg mm -hmm. question you're asking. Um, but I think it's you know looking at how. I've dealt with, uh, you know, how we've had the, the business park, you know, zoning on that uh, east side of 61. Um, you know, ones where we've had to work with it. We we then you know changed our the rules around non-conforming uses to allow the garages and you know the expansion of those mm -hmm. non-conforming uses. I think we can take that experience and into the rezoning and say for your single-family use or your agricultural, you know, f find a way to not create that as non-conforming. To allow that, but it, but still, in the, you know, not not to to prohibit any kind of future, you know, creation of a job center. Um, so there's a lot of details to be oriented. So I understand the discomfort around that because it's there's a existing land use that's been there that you know it's I think people expect it to be there, and we don't want to completely disrupt that for a, something that's going to happen in 2033. We think maybe possibly. Um, but meanwhile, unless we put that, that ma make that map change, nothing's going to happen in 2033. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I've been contacted by a few different people as well. And obviously, if, if they're farming it or whatever they have there now, they're going to be able to continue to use it. Um, if they sell the land, it's still going to be able to be used for what they're going. It isn't going to affect their taxes because it's based on use. the value of it. Um, but yeah, if, if, if it does come to commercial use, they're going to see significant increases in the value Agreed. of the property. So it, I feel it's a really good thing to have happen. And it, it's one of the very few large acre parcels available to develop. Okay. So it does have a lot of great potential, being that you don't have intermittent houses, anything else that you know prohibit 
something large from coming in there. So, so we talked about uh, moving those uh, boundaries off the road. Mm -hmm. If we approve it, um, is that with the? Uh, with the yeah, the change off the road for the one you're talking about there. Correct, and then also the next, I believe, down as I I looked in farther, you got another park that butts up to the road there, on mm -hmm. uh, the other east-west line. Um, and I think, like Donovan said, you know, this is really the high view. Um, I don't think we really need to get down to, you know, well, the, which side of the road at this point. The other question but, I have is if we want to get this pushed through. Um, you, you showed utilities, uh, M MUSA coming down. Do we mm -hmm. want to fast track utilities there? Well, MUSA line's already there, uh, or the main line is there. So it's just the ability for us to connect to it. And as far as water goes, um, that would be a good discussion because we, you know, to spur growth, we may want to bring water farther down Fenway or a couple of the other ones, but I think that'd be a, a workshop discussion with Ryan to find out there's a few sections that we could probably invest in and, you know, recover our tenfold our money afterwards anyway. But I just think about the, uh, the land use, you know, there's plenty for sale signs as you drive down there. Mm -hmm. um, we're changing that zoning to try to get them some uh, sea light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree with you totally. And part of it is getting the county to uh, support us on some of that, um, to help participate with some of it as well. But one step at a time, unfortunately. The only thing I'd like to add to that is without those interchanges, Anybody that's gone south, if they don't get off on 97, you've lost those people. <laughs> they're going right to Lionel. Mm -hmm. you know, even if they need gas or whatever, they're not coming back. They can't get back. So well, I, th you know, you know, I think it's something that we really need if we want the southern part of the city to expand. There's very few people, I think, that want to uh, put a business you know, more than a half a mile from an interchange, um, a mile at the most. But um, you're not going to drive all the way to Highway 97 and come back another two or three miles to get to a business. It just I mean, look how frustrating it is to, even with the new change on Highway 8, you still have to come back to Broadway to go north. I mean, it's just <laughs> insane. But once you lose that car or that vehicle, I mean, it's gone. <laughs> it's not stopping. Yeah, no, and, and um, the, the proximity to both 35E and 35W and, you know, having the ability to get in on and off Either one. Yeah, because I know on 35W from actually 97, which is part of 23, going to Columbus, to 23 again down by Lionel Lakes. That's nine miles. Uh -huh. That's nine miles you can't turn around, you can't do anything. Don't miss the exit. <laughs> All right. Do you want to leave that as is, or do you want in a motion to adjust that area slightly, or leave that up to uh, staff to work out the finite deal detail there? I'd, I'd like to see it rework so um, and push some of the residential area um, along those parks mm -hmm. and on the other side of the road. Are those actually that. park areas there, or are they just... Um, I, yeah, the greens, the green area where your cursor was. Don't believe it's all swamp, so it's got the potential for parks. Because the one is a golf course. It's generally what's what what it became was the generally the the conservancy um, zoning district. Um, what I'm seeing on the map, and this is our just our uh, you know, wetland inventory, is this sort of barrier, and that's why that the parkway comes comes south like this. And then here's that you know Elmcrest and does that 90 degree turn that you mentioned, out to Hornsby. Um, so you're, um, Commissioner Bacchus, what you're looking for is, for the, for the, commercial the resident, you know. Yeah, you explain a little bit more. Right right now? I'm sorry. Your cursor's on a house right there. Yeah. For, then this is where this is this this would be you know the line where it's currently just a it's a, just a property line. Um, a lot line. 
in the you know future parkway it would come somewhere through here is the idea and correct connect there and then all the way through to Fenway so I'd what I'm saying I'd like to see is residential on that south end of that road proposed connecting would be Elmcrest and and Fenway similar to where that existing house is and over to where the uh, um, the farm has a uh, so basically a that thousand foot you know buffer or you know, kind of the, the width all the way across to, to Fenway yeah uh, I guess I don't know the footage exactly but uh, bring it down that way yeah I mean, we would we have kind of a, a, a consistent depth that we thought okay if, if you're gonna extend utilities what makes what would you know what uh, would make attractive for a, a developer to, to do that you know you want to double load you know each road okay I understand what you mean now. Thanks. All right. Any other questions or input? If not, I'll look for a motion. So the motion will just be to present this to adjoining communities for review? Correct. I'll, I'll make that motion. And would that include um, Blaine's modification to that one and everything? I'll accept this friendly amendment. Okay. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Quick question for discussion. Um, so you, so this is the motion to forward on to adjoining communities for review. Donovan, do you bring that, that feedback back to us for final approval? What happens next as far as um, kind of reviewing that feedback and making sure that we have a comp plan, that it we're comfortable is in alignment or that there's um, points of conflict that we're just going to agree to have points of conflict done with those adjoining communities. What does that look like? Correct. Um, basically, we, you know, the comments come in and we address each one. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean we change anything, yep. but we might just restate, you know, our, our community goals. Um, but I do bring that back to the um, city council and then we go for a final Perfect. adoption, final, the final um, permission to submit to Met Council. Perfect. Thank you. And a final adoption doesn't actually come in until following the Met Council review, yep. and there's there's some back and forth there, and then um, when they're okay with it, then we can come back and do that formal review. Right, thank you. I mean, adoption. So then we as a council get to review the other cities as well? Correct. Okay, and that process will start fairly soon then? Or? Yeah, I have two, um, currently I have Columbus and Hugo's plans on my, on my pile of my, on my desk. You know. <laughs> All right. With the feedback exchanging, we're going to have an opportunity to tweak things again as, as we get their feedback and uh, other community speak up kind of thing. Right, I believe mm -hmm. so. All right. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Almost nine. Um, I think the next couple we can get through fairly quick. Donovan? Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, members of council, um, uh, in light of desire to kind of simplify our temporary non-commercial sign regulations, um, this is an ordinance um, proposed uh, that did receive uh, a recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission, was reviewed by them. Um, and basically, it offers a new definition for what we used to call political signs um, and now or opinion signs and now they're called non-commercial signs um, distinguishing between commercial non-commercial speech um, and kind of what we used to call political sign um, and so it offers a new definition that involves speech that's classified as commercial speech including but not limiting to um, not classified as commercial speech, I'm sorry. Uh, not limited to signs containing messages concerning, poli concerning political, religious, social, and ideological topics. Um, and really involves the placement of these signs. Um, we want to be consistent with state statute. And so there's a period which, um, you know, local um, municipal, you know, any uh, state or eight governed bodies can't regulate um, the size or number of, of these non-commercial temporary signs. Um, and that's basically a period from July through November during a state election year. 
Um, I know we had one, one question um, during our uh, the last workshop review around can we shorten this, and I believe that it's probably better to be consistent with the state um, timeline. Um, and also, there's the question regarding um, could there be you know different categories, um, or can you know does the owner have to be um, identified on the sign? And this is just a sign that would, would go in someone's yard, just a, a uh, not not a campaign sign. Um, and the rule there is that if you basically have, if you have to look at it to see if it complies with the uh, the regulations, it's um, that wouldn't stand up in a court of law. And basically, that they have to be content neutral for these type of signs. I mean, ca campaign signs are, are a different category, um, but uh, in this way, we can we can regulate the city can regulate the um, the placement of the signs, but not their content. You know, being in the category or you know. Um, having identified the owner of the sign. And as far as the location, um, we're proposing um, that it be, could be placed in unimproved areas of the public right-of-way. Um, and if it's at least five feet from an improved portion of the right-of-way, which is the paved road, curb, gravel, gravel edge, the maintained portion, the portion that's graded, plowed, et cetera, and at least two feet from a sidewalk or trail. And this idea was um, also in no, no signs in the, in the right, in or on the roundabouts. Um, in addition, the, uh, the, if you're placing it by a, a, a uh, private property, the abutting property owner um, needs to you know, give permission. Um, also, a plan commission uh, question came up on what if this was adjacent to a, um, some public property, maybe a park. Um, in this case, it's um, staff, well, it's a city attorney's opinion that we'd have to just deny that permission because we, we can't be in the business of promoting or uh, um, you know, discouraging you know, these messages. Um, and uh, this really is meant, that the intent of this is to simplify where, where one can put things in the public right of way, knowing the public right of way changes from block to block. Um, so that uh, as long as it's five feet from the, you know, a road edge, um, and two feet from the sidewalk or trail, um, and you have the permission of the, of the uh, adjoining property owner, um, then a, that'd be a, a proper placement for this type of non-commercial temporary sign. Um, also, the, the regulations do, this, this ordinance does uh, clarify that the zoning administrator is the one who enforces the sign regulations rather than the current language which says the city. Uh, the city attorney wanted to be a little more clear on that, which I think is a good idea so that there is some uh, a person, you know, a person identified, uh, you know, in a position to enforce that. These um, happy to take any questions from uh, council this time. Oh, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, the only question I have, and it's always been, you know, political signs that seem to be an issue. Uh, who makes the determination? The public works, whether it's not in the right place. Um, it, would be, it would be me, the zoning administrator. So we don't just have public works citizen, John Q. Citizen calls up and say, hey, there's an illegal sign here, and they go pick it up. Well, we are basically a complaint-based operation. And, uh, those, those would go to me, and I would make a determination whether um, it's in this, this proper location. You don't want public works doing that. But they do. That's why I'm, that's no, why I'm asking. Well, they, 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 they I mean, any time, at any time public works, I mean, any other time besides this, this election year kind of open sign open season, um, you know, the sign can be removed from, from the right of way without any kind of notice. Right. You know, that's just, um, you know, there's an, that's an enforcement issue there. I know we, we could, I could probably do more of that, but, that, you know, we do have the right to remove those besides these. these this, this is really a good change because nobody knows where that line is, where that public right of way is. As long as you're off that that uh, improved part, uh, this is a good this is a good change. Yeah. Well, we went through this in the workshop pretty detailed. So, any other questions for Donovan? Now we'll look for a motion here. <coughs> I'll make a motion that we approve the temporary non-commercial sign zoning text amendment as presented by Donovan. Second. Any further discussion? No. 
I was going to vote. <laughs> all right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Site lease agreement, Donovan. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, members of council, this is something that came before you uh, as a workshop item. Um, the city was approached by Arvig Enterprises um, with a request to be able to link some of their existing fiber um, within um, city right of way um, and actually to uh, build an equipment, um, equipment structure, one story, approximately um, 10 by 12 feet in dimension. Um, on the, the, the southern um, city water tower site. Currently, there is the location of two um, other equipment structures. Here's the water tower. Here's Torn 10th Street on the site plan that was submitted, and it was reviewed by Planning Commission. Um, so basically, what they're doing is extending the existing driveway, improving it a little bit, and then kind of a um, hammerhead for turnaround and for snow storage, um, and with the you know adequate distance from, from the wetlands, and also um, the big city um, water and, and sanitary sewer pipes that are on the other side of that <coughs> skinny parcel off, off of 210th. Um, and uh, the lease was negotiated um, for a $3,000 per, per uh, annual um, cost um, lease to, the, uh, le um, to Arvig with a 3% per year uh, um, increase built in. And um, we also um, basically set it up so that it would uh, not extend longer than the the other um, leases here. Uh, I don't recall at the moment, Dan, can you tell me what, what year that goes out to for the lease? Uh, the current T-Mobile lease goes out to 2033, and this one will go out to 2043. So they're within range of each other. I mean, not dramatically different. So um, at this point, um, what, what staff is requesting is uh, um, council authorization to execute these, um, the lease that was included in your packet um, uh, on the site plan that was an exhibit within the lease. Go ahead. How do, how do we get to rent? How do we set rent? How do you decide what that's worth? Well, I think they, I mean, I think they, um, we offered, you know, I think uh, we looked at what T-Mobile cost is. Do we have other structures similar to this in other parts of the city? I kind of looked at what their base rent was and then just kind of brought it up to current day standards. So 3,000 was, I think another structure is currently like 25 or so. And so I set the base at 3,000, just kind of given the, the difference in terms and the size of this one compared to other sizes, because obviously a bigger unit, you know, a bigger building footprint would require additional, you know, lease rent on there. Okay. Thank you. So a uh, couple of quick questions, but why are they putting another driveway in? Why aren't they sharing the same driveway T-Mobile has? Oh, they, they are. It is it's just extending it. You know, we, and we put it so that... In the well, yeah, but I mean, why wouldn't they just put the opening on the other side of their building and not have to extend the driveway for their building? I mean, well, here, I can't imagine either T-Mobile or them are going to be in there very often. Well, T-Mobile's in there very infrequently, but Arvig estimates they'll be in there at least twi about twice a month. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this is the existing driveway here. This is yeah. the way how it turns. And so this, uh, Public Works wanted this to be improved um, to accommodate, you know, a gr greater frequency of use. And then the extension really is right here. And the idea was we need to stay away from these pipes. We need to stay away from the wetlands. And what if other, in the future, other um, telecoms want to do equipment structures? We could, you know, keep lining them up along in this, in this kind of row okay. on here, like you see. And um, maybe Ryan can answer this, but whatever they're planning to construct, the type of construction, I mean, are, they, are there any potential interferences with T-Mobile, or do they need to do some type of shielding or anything with the equipment they're putting in there? I assume that was discussed part of their agreements and talked through. I gave the restriction on the distance they could be to that 12-inch pipe you see. Yep. So in the event we had, the city had to perform an open cut uh, repair, we would have adequate trench spacing. So that was kind of my condition of review and involvement. All right, thank you. Ed. If we approve this, uh, Donovan, who is going to be public works that has to maintain it? Um, no, not the 
you know, if the agreement is for them to, you know, grade this when needed, um, Public Works does need to come in there in the winter time, and they'll, um, I believe, it's my understanding, they will um, just run, you know, snowplow that would run here is going to run out here. Um, Public Works will, or yeah, yeah, you know, it's a matter of so we are maintaining. You know, at least as far as the snow plowing, yes, but the actual um, road, you know, they, I think, I believe it's set up so that if, if there's any sort of future grading that has to happen, that they'll, they'll do that sort of maintenance. It's just, it's a gravel road. It's not, and it's, we're not, we, based on that use, we don't think there's be high need for maintenance or even need to improve it. I guess I would just want to verify that, you know, this is going to be compatible with, or it is going to interfere with T-Mobile. I mean, we already have a contract with them. I don't want to get us in a conflict here or have them build, you know, a few hundred thousand dollar structure and get us in the middle of something, so. Oh, yeah, certainly. They, they actually have proprietary, you know, information on where these underground lines are, and they knew that they couldn't, for, for instance, they couldn't, use the existing, you know, cable housing to, to you know, to, uh, you know, to feed their structure. And so the way that where this is located is outside the, the boundaries of where the existing fiber is. Uh, Go ahead, Bridget. Oh, sorry. Oh. Thank you, Your Honor. So to that end, we do have language in here regarding obstruction with uh, shall not obstruct other tenants' activities. I think we could add some additional language if someone wanted to approve this uh, to include interference in any way or any capacity with uh, the existing site users. So it's a little bit different usually when you have, for example, cell tower leases and you're putting antennas on top of water towers. There's a lot of concern about interference and interference studies and things like that based on the proximity and the types of devices that are located on the water tower. So to address any potential concerns, I'm not aware of any, but to address that concern, Your Honor, certainly if someone wanted to make a motion to approve this agreement, we could say with additional languages drafted by the city attorney uh, prohibiting any interference with existing uses on the site or existing lessees, including T-Mobile. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, I, I would like to see something fairly, fairly simple along that just so that we're not responsible for being caught in the middle there, issuing two leases on one piece of property that are going to cause a conflict with each other. Blaine. I want a clarification. Arvig isn't currently using our tower, correct? This is strictly going to be just an in and out location for their building? Correct. They're just, they, want, they have fiber in the road, and, and this is a kind of a, an advantageous location, and they're not, they don't act, have any... Um, you know, antennas on the tower, uh, on the, yeah, on the water tower. Um, if they're putting their lines in there, is there even any other room to get in? Say another provider wanted to come in and utilize our tower for rent. Um, between T-Mobile's lines, our big proposed lines, I mean, are we similar to how we've got our road laid out intelligently where we can add on to it? Are our utilities laid out at a decent spacing where we're allowing practical use and expansion of where other lines be coming in, or is this maybe cutting through the middle of a good area and then we just um, shorter ourselves on available space? The interference in mind is kind of the, the ordeal. Mm -hmm. I've heard hubbub about uh, fiber being too close to other fiber, so they run multiple ones in the same conduit. I don't know if it's true or not, but that is a concern I've been told. Um, I don't have a clear answer for that one. Um, Ryan, do you have tower guys at Bolton and Bank who could? We do. This, this tower is pretty much full with what's on it today. Okay. So we also have uh, cell leases on the Forest Street Tower, and we're kind of just waiting for those to run out. But nobody's located on the North Tower yet. We had an application take it as far as development of a lease agreement for the North Tower, and it just stopped. Uh, on this area, you know, as you're talking about the underground line coming back to this proposed shelter, just on the bottom page, kind of where even the red letters are, that's all wetland down there. So they couldn't go any farther to the west or they the bottom of the page. So I think they were, there's other lines, you know, that they know of that they're working around too. It doesn't affect any of the infrastructure of the tower, like the overflow or the pipes coming in and out. Uh, 
So I mean, this is really a logical place for them to build now and plenty of space to continue to keep going southward if another facility wanted to come in. But uh, I think we would see another location before we see some more expansion here, potentially. OK. All right, any further discussion? Nope. Now we'll look for a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the lease with added clarification to be, or uh, with clarification to be added by our city attorney to address interference. I'll okay. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And Dan, street light pole painting. Uh, members of the council, um, this memo is actually from Dave Adams, so I'll do my best Dave Adams impersonation tonight in presenting uh, the memo. Um, but at a previous workshop, there was some discussion on the current condition of the streetlights along Broadway and 61, and staff was directed to, to go back and look at um, options for painting those streetlights. Um, Dave did go back and take a look at uh, get getting some quotes for streetlight painting, and the quote came back and what he was able to, within current budgets, um, allow for the streetlights to be painted. Uh, what he ended up doing was, in, uh, there was $20,000 that was allocated towards the painting of three traffic lights that are currently west of Interstate 35 on Broadway. When that job went out to bid, those bids came back at approximately 12,000, so they came in well under budget, so he had an approximately $8,000 remaining. The um, Pole painting estimate came back at 15000 so there's an $8,000 deficit that he needed to figure out. He looked back at current operations budgets and, you know, through some budget savings that have been seen in the year, uh, uh, year to date, he was able to basically absorb the rest of the $8,000 within current operations. So this, these pole, having these poles painted has no impact on current budget. However, the estimate that's here is basically from the poles that are uh, start at the, the pedestrian bridge along Broadway and go all the way west to Menards. So all those poles will be included in there. It does not include any of the poles that are along um, Lake Avenue and a couple, there's a couple along that Broadway too. I think the poles that have the current, currently have the hanging baskets on them that would need to get painted you know, next year. So they ask me if you do this estimate, there would be, that's enough to basically cover half of the city's poles along Broadway. And then next year you'd want a budget for the remainder to get 61. So that way all the city owned light poles in that vicinity will be painted. Um, and kind of talking to Dave just about lifespan, he said those poles were installed in 2008, I believe. So he said they had approximately 10 years worth of life on the original paint job that was on there. And when he was speaking with the painting company, um, the product they'll actually put down will actually be a better product than what was initially applied to the poles. These will actually be painted or primed and painted so the paint will last longer and give better protection to the poles. So he says if you kind of look at it, you're in essence getting at least 10 plus years out of this investment um, on the light poles. So his recommendation is to authorize the you know, pole painting of the poles along Broadway. Um, and then as we kind of go into the budget process, keep that in the back of your mind for the, you know, authorizing the additional poles along Lake Avenue. Um, he did reach out, Pole Painting Plus would be available to start if authorized. They'd be able to start August 7th, so they would be out here relatively quickly and would be able to get these poles painted. I don't know how long it would take. I just know they'd be able to start in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have regarding the estimate of the project. Dan, did we have other bids on that? That I don't know. This is the one that he presented to me You know, on this. I, I think he probably reached out to a, a company that... I don't know where he solicited it from. He, that didn't come in conversation today. Was he painting, what, 30-some poles? 39 light poles and 19 banner poles. Perfect. What's the total? The 280 for the light poles and 260 for the banners, so a total of 15,860. And he anticipated when he did a kind of a ballpark look at what it would be for 19, that number would be relatively close to giving just the first cut of what the poles remaining would need to be painted is in that same ballpark. For 19 as well. Was there any type of warranty with that? That I would have to go back to Dave on that one, and since he kind of led the, you know, the quotes on these ones. I would at least like to see one competitive bid. I mean. I, the memo sounded like he had other bids. This is the one he brought forth. That's kind of what I read. Is I thought there was other bids, but it was just. Yeah, but it wasn't for the same total of polls. I don't think. He just said paint contractors, <laughs> plural, to get estimates. They did a, after per pole amount was evaluated, that's the part I, I 
grabbed. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't spell it out per se, but the impression I got was that they got a per pull price from multiple contractors. Okay. I would assume he usually gets multiple quotes and brings back the most favorable one. Was this his memo or yours? This was his. This was his. Okay. He had the last minute had another commitment come up, so he kind of asked me to pinch it for him. So that's why I'm presenting tonight. Well, and this is all within Public Works budget right now anyway? Correct, yep. So we're just reallocating the funds to... Yeah, and, and just with the assumption that you'd want to put some money, you know, we need to figure out, because you want to basically put all the poles within a couple of years of being painted, otherwise you could have a couple that look, you know, nicely blue and other ones that's starting to fade out. So having them staged, you know, within a year of each other, would at least have them age out on the same, relatively the same timeline as well. You said color, are we keeping it the same? I believe so. I think it's, uh, I mean, I, it seems like a reasonable price. Um, I guess the next question is what, you know, do we want to all do them all this year and get it, get it taken care of? But do we get a better price? That would be the question. Probably slightly. A, I don't know if it would be a lot. But. Did he get a bid for the whole thing? You know, I don't know. I know there was some conversation. I talked to him this morning with the hanging baskets currently being on the poles. I think that kind of staged out. The company was able to come in and do the ones that didn't have the hanging baskets on there easier versus the other ones. And he said next year the ones that had the baskets on them would be painted prior to them being installed. So we wouldn't have to go through because I think some of them have – the automatic waters in them, and there's some sort of there's a little bit more prep work that's involved in those as well. Are these being sandblasted on site, or what was the prep description? I guess kind of a few things I was curious about. You know, I don't have that level of detail as to what they're doing for prep work on it. I know they're primed, I know they're painted. Those are the two details that I do have. <laughs> it sure seems like a reasonable price per pole when you think about it. I don't know how you can improve on it much. No, that's why I was curious that included blasting for that price. Yeah. Um, so we got $8,000 left over. So halfway covers the rest of them if this is halfway? Well, no, the 8000 would be going to the fifteen, <coughs> so they'd only be using 7000 now. Okay. Um, as far as blasting goes, I, I think they're in such good condition now. Maybe, Ryan, you can speak to that. Not so much on this one, but uh, I know obviously doing maintenance early in the poles, you're going to extend the life and let, instead of letting the corrosion get deep into the, the mast arm. So mm -hmm. I think we're, we're on top of it if we're moving forward now. And I'm sure Dave got multiple quotes because he always does, and I'm sure he's asked all the questions we're asking to the contractor. I mean, so. True. I like the idea of moving forward with doing them all if it's feasible. Yeah, I, I think we should at least approve this, and uh, then we can talk to Dave about getting the rest, but if the contractor's more concerned about the hanging baskets and the amount of labor it's going to take to remove those, and then we should wait till the beginning of next year before they get put up so that it isn't an interference. You want to have staff bring this back to us this fall, maybe? I mean, were we pulling the hanging baskets down this year? Yeah, we typically pull the hanging baskets down after Labor Day, I believe. So, I mean, that I, I can ask if we can get a quote for the full, the full everything and have them done later in the fall. I don't know if this, what pole painting's time schedule looks like, if they're able to, if they're, you know, booked <coughs> up with work in the fall or not. I can ask them to get an updated quote on that and then bring that forward as well. Do we want to just talk about going ahead with this and then bringing in an additional quote for the rest of them yet this fall? Yeah. Go ahead, Ed. The other thing is, does this, can we tie this in, or is there any light maintenance that has to be done on those poles at the same time? Any what? Light maintenance. Those were all replaced with uh, two years ago. They all converted to LED, uh, and those carry a five-year warranty. So the lights themselves have all been managed. So I don't think there would be any light maintenance that would be done because that was all just done not too long ago. And those carry, I think, a five-year warranty on the balls. So if there is an issue, we've been able to get those swapped out. All right. I'll make, uh, go ahead and make a motion. Then. I'll make a motion to approve it. Um, <coughs> Blade pole painting as recommended by staff. A second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Motion carries. All right, Winnick Supply Invoices. I'll make a motion to approve the Winnick Supply Invoices. I'll second it. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And one abstain. All right, City Administrator Recruitment Update. Mr. Miller. I've had a couple uh, discussions I was, you know, really concerned with. This isn't public yet, the, the people that are in the recruitment. And so I think what we're mainly looking at tonight is Jim presenting us, you know, how we proceed, not who we proceed. Um, so I just want everybody to be very cautious of not naming names, but really it's, I think, for him to inform us what, what the best next couple of steps are until we get to that finalist point. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening and for the opportunity to work on this obviously incredibly important project with you. I thought what might be helpful, although you've had the opportunity to read the, the um, application report that I submitted to you over the weekend, um, it might be helpful for those in the audience and those that may be watching just to have a brief background explanation of how we got to where we are today. So I will be brief in those introductory comments. But as you know, we started actively recruiting for this um, vacancy in early June. And we advertised pretty extensively in, in publications such as or on websites such as the League of Minnesota Cities, the Association of Minnesota Counties, the International City County Management Association, the National Association of Black Public Administrators, um, the Hispanic Network, and several other um, organizations. Um, that effort, you know, the last time we were here, somebody asked me the question of how many applications we could anticipate. And I think at that time I indicated that um, if, we, if we had in the 30 to 40 range, that that would probably be about what we could expe <clears throat> expect. And I based that on some recent recruitments that I had been involved in in the metropolitan area where that was the number of applications we received. And as you know from the report, as of July 3rd, which was the, I'll call it the soft closing <coughs> date for applications because we indicated on that date we would begin to review the applications. But obviously if uh, we want to take applications after that point and the council directs that, we could, we could do so. But anyway, as of that point, we received 51 applications. So I was very pleased with the response. And uh, actually, since that point, we've received um, several other applications that are not included. The information on them is not included in the report, mainly because I didn't think that they brought anything that uh, the 51 that already had applied by July 3rd didn't present for your consideration. As you know, my report uh, on the applications received divides them into three categories based on my judgment and my review of the information that they have submitted, and in some cases um, also based on conversations that I have had with them. And the three categories uh, that I have designated uh, for the applications um, are those that I consider to be having the highest level of qualifications or are likely the most qualified for your consideration. And as you know, I've identified 11 people um, in that category. And there's a middle group of people that I think uh, present some of the qualifications that you're looking for or have intriguing possibilities that you may want to consider. But if you were to do that, I would want to do more extensive um, background investigation with them before they rise to that level of, of an interview. And then there's a third group of individuals who obviously are, are qualified individuals, but at least in my judgment, don't have any of the qualifications or very minimal level of qualifications for this particular position. With, um, with that in mind, uh, ultimately the goal for the city council is to identify the number of candidates that you wish to review. But before you do that, uh, you really have to have a discussion about process. And again, maybe a little bit of background would be helpful to refresh you, but also to um, inform those that may be interested in the process and watching it either here this evening or 
or on television uh, why this is an, uh, an issue. There are two laws that come into play when we do this kind of recruitment and we're at the stage that we are, we are now. Uh, one is the open meeting law with which most people are familiar that follow local government and as you know, that means that any time more than a, a majority or more of the council is meeting, it has to be an open meeting. The other uh, law that comes into play is a, a little bit more obscure to the general public but it is um, still relevant to this conversation, and that's the Minnesota Data Practices Act. And essentially what that says is until candidates are declared by you as the city council in this case to be finalists, their application materials, and by that that means their name, where they work, anything that would be relevant to identifying them as a candidate is protected under the law. So if you put those two laws together and you begin to think about how interviews might work, you begin to see, I think, some of the potential, I don't want to call them problems because both laws are, are good laws and well-intentioned. It's just the interaction at this particular juncture in the process does create uh, some, potential, some potential issues. It would mean, for example, that if we were to review the applications in the report this evening with you, we would uh, have to um, identify them by the number in the report would be the easiest way. But even then, it, it gets um, a, a little difficult without uh, slipping into saying so-and-so's name or where that, that person um, uh, works, for example, or lives. But ultimately, that discussion has to occur, um, whether it's this evening or at, or at some point in the future. But to to get ultimately to a finalist uh, uh, classification, and when you do identify candidates as finalists, then their information becomes public. So then interviews that the council holds um, are straightforward. People can attend and witness the interviews if they choose, but um, it's not as, as odd a format as saying, number 12, would you please step forward and let's have a discussion with you. So um, when we get to the finalist stage, this, this issue goes away. Right now it's an issue that um, we, need to, we need to talk about in terms of process. With that in mind, um, there's really, I think, probably four, um, four ways of proceeding um, at this juncture, at least in my mind. And um, certainly I would welcome the city attorney's input on this as well, because she, she may have uh, other ideas or other thoughts about how how you could proceed. But you could um, proceed either this evening or at a later date with a discussion with me about the applications that you have received. And I could give you my um, reactions or my opinions or even my recommendations, if that's what you want, about people that I think you should interview, um, primarily within that group of 11. But um, based, uh, while all of those 11 are qualified, I think there are several within that group that if I were a member of your city council, I would want to interview. But again, it's your judgment, not mine, that's important. So we could have that, that discussion tonight. We could have it at some other point. The other options, which I don't think work quite as well, um, is that the council could, in order to comply at least with the spirit of the, the Data Practices Act and, and open meeting law as well, I guess, you could have serial interviews one-on-one. -on -one. Each of you could meet with all of, with whatever the, the, the candidates that you identify. And then you could come together and you could have a discussion about your individual reactions and try and reach agreement on the number that you want to identify as finalists. Personally, I think that's a little unwieldy and I'm not sure that it, uh, the level of comfort that the city attorney might have with that in terms of how it complies with, um, at least with the spirit of those two laws. But it is theoretically an option. It's one that some cities have, have followed. Another option, um, although I think it's a little late in the process to be considering it, would be to create a subcommittee. And that subcommittee could be consist of less than a majority of the council. And it could also comprise, <coughs> if you decided to do that, um, others that are, are not council members to do the interviews with the semifinalists. Those interviews then could be held in private because you would not be uh, you would not have an open an open meeting. But the disadvantage, obviously, to that is that the major that the entire council 
would not be privy firsthand to those conversations and you would be relying on the input that came back from that committee. Again, that's worked in some communities. It may or may not be an option that you find attractive. And the, the last option would be for you to say, well, um, we're not comfortable in getting to a smaller number, say five of finalists, but we want to interview all, we want to interview eight or nine or however many as semi-finalists. They technically at that point um, would all become finalists. You would have one interview with that group and, and from that interview perhaps narrow it down to a smaller number. The potential disadvantage with that is that a candidate looking at being um, considered at that stage when he or she is among a group of eight or 10 or 11 um, may say it's not worth the risk to me with my current employer to take the chance of having my name exposed publicly at that point in the process. Now I haven't had that conversation with any of the 11 so I can only speculate that that might happen but I wouldn't be surprised if at least some of them balked at, um, at that kind of a process. So ultimately the city attorney and I, I think are of the same, <clears throat> excuse me, of the same mind that probably the best approach for you ultimately is to um, identify if you can a number of finalists from the group of applications that you've received and then to um, go ahead and interview them with the full council as, as finalists. The question then I think is twofold. What is the process that you want to follow? And it would be good to get clarity on that this evening if that's at all possible. And then secondly, once you're comfortable or you're in agreement with what the process is going to be for getting to the finalist stage, how are we going to decide or how are you going to decide, because it's your decision, obviously not mine, uh, who the candidates are that you want to interview as finalists. Some of you may not be comfortable with doing that this evening. I fully understand that it's a, it's a matter that you have to, it, it's your process, and I, I can't underscore that enough. So however you want to proceed, we can certainly accommodate that and we'll make, uh, we'll make those necessary adjustments. But we need, I think, to kind of keep the process going in the, in the sake of trying to make sure we don't unintentionally uh, lose candidates by delaying the process for too long a period of time. So I don't know if that's helpful, Mr. Mayor, but certainly answer any questions that um, you might have. Well, definitely added a lot of clarity to it. Um, the two days is not nearly enough time to review sure. what we have. Yeah. And I know I had discussions earlier with you mm -hmm. concerning, you know, how do we not name candidates? How can we discuss it? You know, it's, it's, there's got to come up with a better system for, you know, for the public to, or for councils to do this without violating those laws and you know on both ends because right. you know out of concern for the applicants as well I think so, the technical term is it's clunky perfect <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think you know we all have we're all gonna have different views on it and personally what I'd like to see is each one of us rely re, reply to Jim on one to five to whatever you know candidates that you think are the best and you know between the five of us you know hopefully that narrows the field down to a select few uh, once that field is narrowed down um, it's possible that you know you could contact those candidates to to confirm that they want to continue in the process um, and at that point, then bring it back to the full council for discussion. <clears throat> but I think we really have a, a, a step in here that we need to each privately relay back um, without <coughs> any open discussion here, what our thoughts are on, you know, what who we feel are the best candidates moving forward, and then bring that back to the council for discussion. Any other thoughts? Um, I was going to suggest a very similar process. Um, my question for you is, mm -hmm. is that information better conveyed via email? Is it better in a phone conversation so you can kind of confirm clarity and look for where there's areas of consensus? Or how do we best facilitate that? Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> uh, Councilmember Bain, 
so that there's no confusion in their or in the translation of the conversation. Right. My preference would be email, I think, but that doesn't mean we couldn't also have phone conversations. I'm certainly willing to, to do that. Okay. I mean, in fact, I'd welcome that. If, if you have questions about candidates that I haven't provided comments mm -hmm. on or you want to see more materials, mm -hmm. um, I can, I'll certainly supply those application materials and we can, we can go back and forth. It, it doesn't have to be email, but okay. um, I think that might, might be my preference. Well, and I think we need to look at, you know, are we going to do this within one week? And, you know, Agreed. otherwise, Time important. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to leave the, this open to, well, somebody didn't reply, now it's two weeks, it's three weeks, then we could lose potential candidates okay. that route. So, Mr. Um, Mayor, I, I think that's really crucial. Um, one other piece of information that I didn't put in the report, but kind of supports your comment um, now, is that once I have the list of candidates that you want to interview, it'll take us about two weeks to do the detailed background investigation. You'll get a report um, probably as lengthy as the one I just gave you that will be about the background of each of those individuals. So it's very comprehensive, very extensive, but it does take um, a good two weeks. So add that on to when the decision gets made before the interviews can occur. So a week, so, I, I think a week works very well. Um, I, I think, is everybody okay with a week, Alan? Yeah, well, you know. Can we say by end of day Friday even, just to give you the weekend and yeah. you mm -hmm. can get started early next week mm -hmm. then? Mm -hmm. I, I'd be okay with that. Plain? She answered the question. All right, perfect. Ed. What I would like to know is, and maybe I missed it somewhere in one of your reports, but could you, basically for, for my benefit, provide me with like an email of how you weighted these people? I mean, there must be things like, because the spectrum of candidates is pretty large, mm -hmm. everything from clerks <coughs> to city planners to right. previous city administrators. How do you, is it years of experience carry so much? Uh, or they did this kind of project and that carries some weight? It would be helpful to me sure. as to why you think okay. candidate A is better than candidate B. Okay. Do you mean in general or do you want for? Just general. Yeah. Just, you know, like. um, well, I can, I can tell you just, and I can certainly give you a more detailed response by email, but <clears throat> I wish it were formulaic where you could you could look at the years of experience or you could look at the size of the community or you could look at the type of position and plug it in and come out with an answer. Um, certainly those things get are, are part of the, the calculation, but in the end it's it's a little bit of a, of a judgment call of how even even subjective things like how well have they written the application letter how um, how have they responded in that application letter or in the resume to the things that we've identified as important for the city of Forest Lake in the recruitment profile? So it's, it's, it's part judgment, it's part looking at the, the credentials that they have and then coming up with a, a, a recommendation. I mean, there are some, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's, a, there's probably a couple in that group of 11 that um, I could find people below that level in the in the middle group, for example, that I could support bringing up as well. At, at some point, y you draw a line and you say. But the question is how you do the line, I guess. Yeah, it's it's based on things like experience, relevant experience. It's based on um, size of the organization. It's based on tenure in the positions. Um, it's based on conversations that I've had. Even with that middle group, I've had conversations with a number of the applicants. And so all of those factors kind of go into, into making that recommendation. Are you privy, and I mean, once they become known as candidates, you can then reach out to their previous employers or not? Certainly we will. Yeah, I mean, for the finalists, that'll be part of the background investigation. We will check their references. We'll verify their credentials. We'll make sure they were employed when they said they were and where they said they were. Um, we'll look at credit history. We'll look at um, any criminal history. We'll do as detailed an investigation as, as possible. Anything else? Um, 
learn. So I have a question about your list. Is the one through 11, mm -hmm. is the number one a higher candidate no, in your opinion? They're, that they're, they're alphabetical. Oh, well, thank you. Yep. Are, um, are a majority of these applicants um, people you're familiar with? In the top 11, I would say I'm familiar with probably four or five um, personally, um, <clears throat> either through past associations of one kind or another or having them as applicants for other positions. So I've had some opportunity to talk to them several times. Okay. Ed? You kind of answered my question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was going to ask you how many of these applicants have you placed previously and are you allowed to give that information out? Um, I can tell you that several of them have been candidates they have and, and have interviewed. Um, they have not been hired. They're obviously a candidate now for this position. But I didn't place any of them in the position that they're in now. Maybe I'm asking too deep, so if you can't answer it, that's mm -hmm. fine. But say out of those top 11, mm -hmm. are there any of them you see there that are, you know, this guy is really qualified, but he's just looking at a stepping stone? Um, or do you feel that all those 11 candidates are somebody looking to stay in a position here in Forest Lake? It's hard to answer. I know. Um, it's, because I, it's, I know it's really difficult. Well, it's and, a gut and it's, feeling as well. No, 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 it is. It's an important question. It really is. It's just hard to, I mean, you can even ask somebody and say, are you, is this a career, is, you know, are you going to make a commitment to stay here? Well, they're, they're going to do what they think you want to, I mean, you know, answer. people are so overqualified uh, that you're like. Right. What I, what I can tell you is that um, for a number of the candidates, well, for several of the candidates, at least, three, I think, that I can think of off the top of my head that are in that 11. This would probably be the final move in their career uh, for different reasons. Um, there are a couple of others maybe that would look at it more as a advancement in their career and maybe here for five, six years and then gone. In and of itself, that's not a bad thing. It's it's a consideration, and you certainly want, you want. I think more than more than the more than the number of years they're going to be here. You you really want to have someone not only that's qualified but wants to be here, and that's something you really only get a feel for. I think in the interview, but I can tell you that there's a couple of candidates in this in this group of eleven that truly want this position very, very, very badly, very badly, for different reasons. That's not in and of itself a reason to hire them, but all other things being equal, someone who really wants a position, um, can that can be a, a deciding factor. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix, I guess. I know I'm not directly answering your question, but it's no, I, about it's, the best it's I can do. It's a difficult question. It to, truly is. It truly know, is. Yeah. Especially being put on the spot like that. Right. But you know, with the years of experience you yeah. had, you know, sometimes yeah. your ability to read a person is as valuable as anything anyway. I don't think there's anybody in that 11 that is looking at this, how can I say it? Some, well, there's, there's maybe one candidate in that group that I'm aware of that is broadly looking um, at another, at a similar position to, to Forest, either Forest Lake or a similar position. Mm -hmm. And I think he would be equally happy in a position in another state or in this position. Now, if you were to hire him, if you were to interview him and hire him, I think he'd do a good job. He'd be, you know, he'd be, he's, a, he's a good candidate. Mm -hmm. But I think his level of interest in Forest Lake is maybe not quite as focused as that of some of the other candidates. Sounds and again, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just a consideration that if you were to interview them, you'd want to explore more thoroughly, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, any other questions for Jim? Go ahead. When we get to the interview process, mm -hmm. um, oh, it's a public meeting, right? Um, right? Do we decide on questions? To, were we asking the same, all of the candidates the same questions, and do you help us develop that mm -hmm. list? Um, is it different questions by candidate? What, what, what do you recommend, and what's... What, typically, yeah. Well, what I will do is give you a list of suggested questions, 
and then you can decide whether that's the list you want to go with or you want to amend it, and that's what we'll do. And in the actual interview process, um, again, it's, it's your, your decision. My recommendation to you would be that only one person ask the questions for a couple of reasons. One, it's the more expedient way of getting through the interview process, so it's a little more distracting when people are looking around and trying to figure out who's asking the next question. Um, <clears throat> it also, sure, also assures maybe a greater level of consistency, but if, if your decision is you want to rotate and ask questions, I'd, I've worked with it that way, and it's certainly a fine way to do it as well. It's really a matter of preference. Yeah, I think we'll have a little time to refine the interview yeah. process. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, also have a little more of a casual meet and greet type greet. thing, either before or after the interview process, but before we make a decision, because it's one thing to be, you know, on the spot getting grilled, and another thing just to have a casual discussion with somebody. And this is maybe helpful as you think about timing in this whole conversation we're having. What I um, have recommended to you and, and would suggest as a good way to proceed with the interview is think of it as a, as a two-day process. On the first day, and normally a Friday and Saturday work well, both for council members and, um, and for the candidates. But on Friday, um, it would be begin with the candidates being at City Hall and being given a tour of the city facilities in the city, an opportunity to interact with your department directors, um, maybe lunch with the department directors, could even be a box lunch here at City Hall with them. Um, a little time off in the afternoon followed by um, an open house for the community where you can invite whoever wants to come to meet the candidates, um, the opportunity to do that. That evening you could have a reception for the council and the candidates. I think receptions work better than dinners because at a dinner you get placed next to someone and you don't necessarily get the chance to interact with everyone else that, that's there. But that'll give you some of that one-on-one -on -one opportunity with the candidates. And then on Saturday you do the actual formal interviews with the candidates. So you as a council would have at least a couple of opportunities, one more informal one in a formal interview process to uh, to talk to the candidates. Uh, during a, a reception, and even though the public's invited, mm -hmm. you could still talk one-on-one -on -one with a candidate without violating public meeting laws? I defer to the city attorney. So, Mayor, members of the council, these would all be posted as meetings and open meetings, essentially. So anyone who wants to come from but the, the public. The, the public wouldn't be privy to my conversation with a candidate. Well, if they are standing near you and hear the conversation, yes, they would. No, but I'm, what I'm saying is it's not like you're sitting in front of a microphone here. No, I don't know exactly you know, how you would structure it. And I'm not sure how. But I, I, my question is, it's legal to do that? It's legal to note it so long as the public is there and is able to, you know, they come over and you can't say go away. They're here, they're listening. That's uh, similar. So, it creates logistical challenges, and as uh, Jim indicated, there's this uh, interference or interplay between these two laws that just don't work in the hiring context. I mean, they just don't work, but we have to work around them because that's what the law is, and so we can try and structure it that way. Uh, but again, any of this interview process, any of this discussion process, this is all going to be open to the public who wants to, to be present if they shall choose. So maybe after lunch on Friday, we could get a pontoon. Let them go out on the lake, and the one that makes it back, we can hire. <laughs> well, that's one way to do it. <laughs> Similar question to um, in social open houses. Is there a way we could, you know, each occupy a conference room on our own and cycle our top finalists through, so we get a chance to meet them one on one, just have a short conversation mm -hmm. without pressure. Um, you know, 15 minutes or five minutes. As long as the whatever. conference room is open to the public, I would think that, again, we'll have to clarify that with our attorney. Just would it need to be if it was just one council member and one candidate per room? So, Mayor, members of the council, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because there is one case out of Mankato, North Mankato, actually from 1997. It was a court of appeals decision in Mankato Free Press versus City of North Mankato 
where there was a number of decisions made regarding kind of open meeting law and data practices act issues it was held that if you had one-on-one -on -one closed interviews in that particular case uh, it was not necessarily an illegal serial meeting because there was no intent for the council to try and uh, sidestep the intent of the open meeting law or violate the open meeting law but Again, I caution the council that whenever you get into sort of a serial interview situation, uh, you do uh, want to be cognizant of that decision and of the legal uh, considerations out there if you're going that route because of the concern for potential open meeting law violations. So, um, and I understand the serial portion of that. Would we be able to potentially submit written questions to all the candidates at one time and get those answers back at the meeting so that you know candidate C doesn't hear what candidate A said for the same question but you know um, and those results would be public well yeah the final once they're final they yeah. say would yeah. be but you know if if each one of us had some questions I don't know but then again, maybe, well, even if we develop the question, we can develop those right at a council meeting or, you know, take input on questions. But, you know, those answers then aren't, you know, one candidate doesn't have the opportunity to overhear another candidate's answer to that. So it's, it's um, you know, a true answer to that. You're, you're trying to address, uh, address the logistical challenge of the interviews open to even the candidates themselves. Right. right, and so exactly. trying Although to I, get. I, I can assure you that, that the candidates will, um, won't, won't attend the other interviews. Okay, okay. So that, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have an interview, is that it'll, a, it'll be open. Is that just a professional etiquette? It's, let's call it that. Okay. All right, well, I think we got enough to go on, and we'll. Mr. Mayor, just for my clarification, so you will get me feedback individually by Friday. Is that the, the, the decision? I believe that's where we're and, and, the day for and then I will get that back to you in terms of how that arrays, what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And then we will have another meeting. Are we that able to help pair down the amount of right. choices? Are we, we able have. to set a date a for target? that? We're going for five. We're going for, I, you know, I think it's up to each one of us. How many feel are qualified? I mean, whether it's three per person or five or 15, but um, I just think the list we have now is, is cumbersome. cumbersome and mm -hmm. and no, it is. this is a good way to get down to the. I think we should pick a number. I mean, whatever that number is. I mean, be. three to me per person. I mean, I don't know how many are going <clears> to <throat> be, be the same That should be the maximum. Anyway. That should be the maximum. Three. Then my last question. Up to three, let's put it there or something. My last question, we're not limited to your 11, are we? No, not at all. It's so it's entirely your everybody list. Everybody on that list, but if we wanted to introduce somebody else as well, we could do that. Yeah, I... Not having submitted an application may start to creep into kind of uncomfortable okay. area, but all right. well, certainly okay. anybody that's applied... Um, okay. It's your decision who you want to interview, not mine. Okay. Do we want to set a meeting date for the, a follow-up meeting? Um, are, is this a special meeting or are we, next council meeting is a couple of weeks away? Um, we could do a special meeting. Um, I'd like to have it part, it's two weeks, or not four weeks, two weeks, right? Well, if we get it back by Friday, the ball's in Jim's court, then mm -hmm. when, you would come back to us. Yeah, if you could, I mean, if it worked to have a meeting next week sometime, I think that would be that would be great. If that's not possible, obviously it's not. But again, the risk, and I, the longer it goes, the more potential there well, is that we'll lose takes, candidates. Uh, I think 48 hours notice for a meeting, so mm -hmm. um, I think I'd just like to make sure it works with all of our schedules. Yep. I don't want to okay. do something there. But yeah, we could definitely call a meeting as Okay. As early as Next possible, time. anyway. Yes. Sure. Uh, while you were out, we decided that you know we're going to submit max of three. Max of three. Yeah. Okay. And the goal then would be ultimately to see if you can agree on three to interview. Is that it, or well, would I you? I think we'll probably be seeing more than three. You know, maybe five, okay. six, something like that. But it'll be a lot easier to manage and 
but we don't know. And then maybe that's where our special meeting is to confirm that list and right. see if it's, you know, if we each submit and those three. Those are just finalists. I mean, right. we're not picking the right. Right. candidate. We're just right. picking the finalists. Right. So. Worst case scenario, we've got a list of 15 and we decide what to do with it. We might have to call it down in a conversation. Okay. So we're going to submit our three to Jim by Friday? Yep. And he's going to take the three, and if there's duplicates, we make it a smaller list then? Right, exactly. Okay. Bridget, everything we've done so far sounds okay. So I think if the idea is kind of get council feedback, provide some information about candidates to Jim, uh, I'll work with Jim as far as kind of the presentation of that information. Then at the next meeting, information that's already been presented plus additional information that's generated by the council conversations would be presented to the council. And it would be at that time that the council could potentially come up with its list of finalists. Mm -hmm. So I think Correct. that would be the goal. Mm -hmm. So the council, again, has to name someone a finalist. That's got to be a formal action taken by the council. So this is just an additional way to provide feedback and information to Jim and then circulate it with the council. And so where I'm looking to expedite things as well is mm -hmm. once you get that list pared down to the less than 15 number, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would it be logical for you to reach out at that point and say, you know, council's most likely mm -hmm. going to declare you a finalist? Do you want to be, you know, would that help possibly pare down a couple, three more at that point? I'm just wondering, or do you want a way for us to declare it a finalist and then? No, I'll be having conversations certainly with all 11 um, tomorrow because okay. I've promised them I'd give them an update regardless of what happened this evening. Okay, all right. So Sounds I good. will, again, make sure that they're still interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <coughs> so please, please update us if somebody drops mm -hmm. out. Yeah, no, I will. I certainly will. Do that. At one well, last point for me, we say we each come up with our three candidates. I assume you want some type of opinion or reasonings why we selected who we did or not. Mr. Mayor, I don't necessarily think that's necessary. If you want to supply that, you certainly can, but it's your prerogative, I think, as an elected official to pick the people that you feel in your judgment are the ones that you want to interview. So. You may want to have that discussion when we get together to right. identify the, the ones you're going to interview amongst yourselves, but um, I think it's certainly within your prerogative to, to name whoever it is on that list you think you want to interview. Is the 30th too soon to have a meeting? That's the next Monday. I have all my Mondays open. It would be convenient for me. Yeah, I, you know, that probably makes the most sense what, to keep it on It works Monday. for me. I have one more question on the process. So if we give you all three of our we all give you our mm -hmm. three. You're going to take that list and bring it back to us again? Yes, you'll have that prior to your meeting on the 30th. You will get um, probably a much briefer report than you got here, but a companion to this document that will say, based on the feedback I've received from all of you, here is what it looks like in terms of agreement on candidates. And then when we get together on the 30th, it will be taking that information along with the report that we have here and whatever else is relevant for you to consider, and then saying, here are the people we want to interview, if you can come to that, that kind of agreement. So at the meeting, per se, the 30th, we will discuss amongst us, without giving names away, who right. we'd like to narrow it down to? Yes. I mean, that would be the intent. Mm -hmm. Do we have a number in mind on that one? You know, until we review who they are, it's going to be difficult to say how many we... Okay. I would like to see, you know, five to six. I mean, I think, you know, three is enough, but, you know, let's give a couple of options anyway. So, Chad, one of the things that I guess I'm uncomfortable with is that we're, we're selecting on the basis of their resume. I mean, that's all we really got right now. Yeah. And for that reason, we may want more numbers to be part of that finalist list. We might want a bigger this pool. Is a, you know, any piece of paper, anybody can write anything. It's tough. And I can interpret any way I want when I read it. Mm -hmm. But had I talked to that person, or had you talked to that mm -hmm. person, now I got a different, a well, different that's, perspective. That's part of where I was asking too, with you know how many of them you've had before, because you would have backgrounded them and mm -hmm. done a lot of the research already. So you know there, there's nothing that's going to be a red flag coming up on those. But if I understand candidates. Jim right, you have not talked to every candidate. No, I haven't talked to all 51 well, of them. That's what I'm saying. Some of them are just a written resume at this point. Right. Right. 
So. I have talked to at least several in that middle category. I don't believe I've talked, well, I have talked to one or two in the category that I have said don't meet the recommended requirements for the position, but not all of them. Any other questions or Bridget, everything seems okay with you? Got one last thing. Go ahead. Ed. We submit our names. Are you automatically ruling out the other candidates then or will they just be in limbo? No. No, not until you finally make a decision. Once you do that, I'll be back in touch with all the other candidates and okay. all right. I just don't want to forego some candidate no, absolutely. because he didn't write a very good resume. Yep. No. Mm -hmm. Once you tell me who your finalists are, then I'll be in contact with the others. Excellent. And to clarify again, this process is to gain council feedback and gain council comments about applicants. It is not a uh, process to declare a finalist or determine finalists. That's what will happen at the next meeting. It's purely right. a informational gathering process to give Jim more information from the council and then to be able to share that with the council itself. I think this should be one of those legislative priorities we establish next year. <laughs> come up with a uh, surefire way, a more reasonable process anyway. <laughs> it's called a hat. We'll put there the hat. <laughs> Believe me, it's like been tried. Both of you instead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Council. So Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, whoops, let's close everything up before we're done here. <clears throat> Staff updates. Donovan. Um, yes, sir, Mayor, Mayor, members of council, um, we did receive another apartment uh, building submission um, today and for proposed 91 units. Uh, it's a Mike Keating project uh, over by uh, intersection of 11th Avenue Southwest and the Hardwood Creek Trail. Um, also, we, this week we did have the pre-construction meeting for Headwaters 11th, so that's going to be moving on with um, road construction um, in, planned for August and September for that. Uh, including the Ed Edwards Parkway um, addition. And then also uh, we did um, also we're having the, uh, the final plat submittal for uh, Headwaters Place being reviewed uh, with the Planning Commission on August 8th with hopefully we get that to uh, Council on the 11th. And I really want to appreciate, uh, say again, appreciate your efforts with uh, getting this comp plan update um, adopted and uh, the feedback you provided has been really valuable. So appreciate it. Right. And uh, I think, uh, I can't remember exactly what, but I know uh, Mike Keating, um, they just won a very prestigious national award, I think, for uh, their commitment, their company, and their business practices. So, I mean, they've been doing a great job, and glad to have them here in Forest Lake anyway. Mm -hmm. so. Chief. Mayor, members of the council, uh, earlier, later last week, we went to Linwood Fire Department and looked at their uh, tender that we are considering uh, using. Um, I think it will uh, work for us for uh, uh, a short period of time. Uh, they did a full uh, check on it uh, earlier this year. Uh, so it's already been through the maintenance check on it. Uh, I'm looking at it, I felt pretty comfortable. It's in pretty good shape. Uh, top speed on it's about 45 miles an hour. Um, so it's not the fastest truck, but I think that um, in order to keep our ISO and to, to have water available, I think it, it's going to be a good fit for, for our needs at this point. Uh, same similar color or do we I mean, it's lime green so renaming it and mm -hmm. whatever i mean for a short term anyway we won't have to yeah it, it you know it doesn't come with any equipment uh it does have a small uh trash pump on it uh but it's specifically just going to be a water hauler okay. sounds good any questions for the chief why only 45 <laughs> Um, age. <laughs> um, well, it's a six by six too, isn't it? Uh, yes, army truck. Okay, got it. Yeah, but I think it will fit our needs for for the interim. And then uh, later this week, we'll meet with our truck committee, uh, talk about future plans that we had discussed last week. Uh, you know, where the fire department's going for response and 
and needs uh, into the future, and then um, a discussion on you know the tender uh, moving forward, what uh, needs that we have to fulfill. What would we be looking at for for a new tender? Uh, in the short term, what are you doing with the old one? I mean, have you we given up on it? Well, I did, uh, as previously stated, we did get four bids uh, for repair work on it. Uh, one did come back at 46500 and then three other companies refused to bid on it. So it's going where? To auction or what happens to it? Yeah, I, I would guess that's what we'd do with that truck is put it for public auction. I thought you were going to keep that for some training. That would actually be the uh, one of the, the next... Uh, engine pumpers uh, yeah, that will right. keep kind of as a spare truck part or a spare truck four parts should the other one that's identical break down uh, be able to rob parts off that and then we'd use that for training until eventually when both of them are replaced then we'd put them into auction okay all right any other questions for the chief Chief Peterson yeah mayor and city council Members, I only have a couple of items for you. Um, one is we've received quite a few requests over the last couple of weeks uh, in regards to uh, putting out our speed trailer out in uh, residential areas and on uh, roadways. And um, some of those requests came through you, and I definitely appreciate you forwarding on those um, requests from residents. And I encourage um, people to contact either um, the police department or you as well, and uh, let us know where they'd like to say that speed trailer um, uh, located. When you put those out, how long do you, how long are they at each location? We, we try to put them out there uh, for a few days. Mm -hmm. If we don't get a request for a while, we might even put it out there for like a week or so. Um, but we get so many requests that we at least try a day or two, okay. you know, so there's an <laughs> abundance of people that are, are seeing it. Thank you. Now, does that, I can't remember. Does that record? I mean, we're not ticketing, but does it actually record the number of vehicles and the speeds of the vehicles? Or yes, it, it records just... the um, number of vehicles, the speeds of the vehicles. Uh, we actually have printouts, and we actually um, share those with the um, residents if they give us their uh, name and uh, contact information, and they really appreciate that because sure. um, it's. What have you been seeing? I mean, are, are, are there areas where there is an accessible amount of speeders? Or? Um, I guess I can't come up with like a certain area, but um, in reading those reports, it is pretty amazing how many people are actually going the speed limit. And it might just be either they're slowing down because they know that the um, speed trailer is there, um, or is it that they usually don't speed in the area? But, it, you know, we do see some spikes. There are definitely uh, some areas on the roadways uh, and such that, you know, people are definitely speeding. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. That does yeah. not have camera capability, does it? Uh, it, it is not equipped with a camera. And, and we don't, yes, it can be. Um, but we don't, um, it doesn't have like a license, license plate reader or anything like that equipped to it. We saving that data for future use as far as? Yep, we save all the data actually. Yeah, just in case if somebody comes forward a few months from now and, and you know, requests the speed trailer, and we have no problem putting it out you know, again and again and again in certain areas, but um, it is nice having that data so we have it available to, to show residents if they uh, want to see it. Is that a valid traffic count then too? Mm-hmm, yep. All right. And then uh, the second item I have for you is uh, just a reminder to everybody that August 7th, uh, Tuesday is night to night. So I encourage everybody to participate. We do have, I believe, 21 or 22 block parties already signed up. And then, of course, the, um, the main one is at, uh, uh, at the Arts in the Park. I have a question on the incident, the last incident where the person, you had a fatality, and I believe it was turned over to the medical examiner. Anything that you can, our liberty to say? Um, from what I understand and uh, what the medical examiner um, reported is that um, the individual died from natural causes. Okay. That was the standoff incident? Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Any other questions for the chief? 
All right, thank you. Yep. Bailey. Nothing for me, thanks. All right, and Bridget. Thank you, nothing for me, Your Honor. Takes it down to you, Ryan. Uh, Mayor City Council, just want to give you some updates with the Safe Routes to School project. That's actually moving very fast. Probably got started that project after the 4th of July. Probably have about 80% everything removed and filled up. Uh, already got 300 feet of sidewalk poured, and I know a lot more concrete's coming this week. Uh, local road project, we should finish up the storm sewer this week, and then the uh, contractor will come in and do the full depth proclamation, and then be able to do uh, the curb, the spot repairs on the curb and stuff like that, and then prep the road for uh, repaving. Uh, we've had two good conference calls with MnDOTs related to the intersection of Highway 97 and North Shore Trail. Potentially, cross your fingers, there's some funding uh, that's been found from MnDOTs that would uh, uh, potentially lead to a 2020 project. Um, so Dan and I yeah. have been on uh, the calls with them, helping them gather information with the property to the north. Uh, that's where they would mitigate some storm sewer uh, um, treatment. So that potentially continue to move forward and uh, hopefully that becomes a reality in 2020. Uh, Monday, if you guys are in a meeting, uh, if you can find any chance to stop by out at the Forest Hills Golf Course with the annual chamber events that will be happening Monday. I think it starts tea time at uh, 11.30ish or so. And then, you know, there is a dinner that follows that, but. A lot of local businesses will be there, uh, and you know uh, some businesses do come from a far away for that. But we will be on hole 11, and we'll have a team golfing too. So feel free to stop out. That's all I got. Um, question to clarify for you: uh, 190th, the chip seal project, whatever you want to call it, on there, um, is that? where it's ended right now, or are we looking at doing any more on that road? They're done, so that's... Okay. That's as far as we could get, and... Yep. Okay, no, I was just curious anyway. I had a resident out there that was asking where, okay. you know, where the rest of it is. It didn't quite make it to them. <laughs> Looks nice. So, um, and then... Um, uh, I, it was gone. Anyway, uh, I'll catch up with you later if I have a question on that. Any, anyway, um, so yeah, that's all for me. Any other questions for Ryan? That's it. All right, Sam. I attended the uh, fundraiser for the Youth Service Bureau at the Taste the other <coughs> evening, and uh, don't know how exactly how they did, except that the food was really good. It was a rainy evening, and the place was packed. I mean, packed. I think I parked in Lindstrom, walked back to the Chisago. But uh, it was a really good event, and I hope it worked out well for him. Uh, there was no way of knowing what the final tally was when I was there, so I don't know what it, how they were, how they made out. Hopefully they did well. Yeah. All right. Yeah? A uh, couple things. Uh, I watched, did not attend any meetings in person, watched a bunch of meetings on television, watched the Planning Commission, I watched, I believe it was Comfort Lake, watched the Park Commission. And I just want to say hats off to those people. They don't get enough in the way of accolades because, I mean, they put in a lot of hours for <laughs> very little recognition. And they're, well, they're very well-run meetings. They really are. Uh, so that was good. And then the other thing I'd like, I, mean, I want to kind of help, and I think it's a part of the Youth Service Bureau. I just trying to get rid of an old riding tractor that I had sitting around for a year. And I Googled, and the place on Lake Street came up, and I called them up. Oh yeah, we're happy to pick it up because we work with youths that repair them and if they can sell them, they sell them or if nothing else, they learn something about small motors, that kind of thing. Well, the guy came in and it happened to be a, a police officer that came out, White Bear, that picked it up. All volunteers, all putting in all kinds of hours. But it'd be nice to get that word out. I didn't know that we even had that service to uh, pick up lawnmowers. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the same situation I was in. like. Got two of these tractors. I only needed one. Oh. Yeah, Council Member Eigner, um, I believe the program is called Tried and True. That's it. Yep. And uh, it's been around, I think, for about a year and a half, two years. And uh, you are right. You summed it up very well. And I know the Lake Center for Youth and Families uh, appreciates um, the little advertising you just gave them. So. But I mean, really, they. I don't know if we have it on our website or not, but it should be. Yeah, it's um, on Lake Center for Youth and Families uh, yeah. website. I definitely know that. 
Facebook page too. Very nice people. Very good. I mean, I hope it good. You know, it goes to good cause. You know, so. Now he's coming back to look at the jet skis. So <laughs> maybe I'll get rid of another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good for them. Anything else, Ed? No, no that's all I got. All right. Uh, I don't have anything to report this week, so take that, please. Uh, Parks Commission had a meeting followed by a uh, workshop right after just due to scheduling conflicts last time around. Um, again, they are still grateful that we filled the vacancies because uh, it's been tight and a couple people got a state for part of the commission meeting and uh, they had to take off. They could continue the meeting because they did have a quorum. So it's been, That's good to hear. It's been a good change. Um, they are excited to start looking at possibilities with those uh, city-owned properties that butt up to the lake. Um, that'll be, I was told it'll be on the agendas coming up for them. Uh, they regroup their organization, they're moving forward. Um, so I hope to see good some good you. things out of there. Great. Mark. Fantastic. Uh, just a couple quick updates. Uh, attended a YMCA board meeting last week. They just got a grant from Washington County for some bikes. Um, there's three bikes available. Um, and one of the bikes that is available is a arm bike that is for arm, arm operation only. Those will be available um, for use as soon as they're, they, they were expecting a helmet donation like any day now. Um, as soon as they have helmets, those will be available. So fun new amenity out there. Um, also attended a cable commission meeting, did a first draft of a budget that'll come back for our next meeting for approval before it comes here for council. Um, and then a fun announcement from Leela. They just um, found out last week that they got their accreditation for their middle school international baccalaureate program. Uh, so now they are IB um, authorized for K through, that goes through 10th grade. Next year they'll do their site visit for the diploma program, which is the 11th and 12th grade program. Um, and what a great community amenity for us to have international baccalaureate K through 12 next year. Um, they are coming to the planning commission for the um, CUP amendment that was tabled on Wednesday because they really need to expand with all of these, this new programming. So exciting stuff happening there. All right, sounds great. I think that covers everything. I'll look for a motion to adjourn. You don't have any? That's it. You don't have a report? Make a motion to adjourn. I've been, uh, I've been tied up on some stuff. But. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Sam. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.